On October 1, 1993, 12-year-old Polly Class Petaluma invited two friends for a sleepover. The evening proceeded smoothly until Polly's mother, Eva, was abruptly awoken by intense screaming. She soon discovered that her daughter had been kidnapped by an unknown assailant. Lai Hannah Class was born on January 3, 1981, in Fairfax, California. Her family comprised her father, Mark, her mother, Eva, and her younger sister, Annie. When she was very young, her parents separated. Following the separation, Polly and her sister went to live with their mother in Petaluma. Mark subsequently entered a new relationship and Polly developed a positive relationship with his partner. This arrangement created a harmonious family dynamic where Polly spent time with both parents without any issues. Polly is often described as a quiet and innocent child. Although she had friends, she was generally shy. However, she found confidence in theater. Polly participated actively in school plays and various musicals organized by her community. Frequently cast in lead roles, her primary aspiration was to become a successful actress in musical theater. Furthermore, Polly had a fondness for sleepovers. She enjoyed having friends over and visiting friends' homes for such gatherings, a regular activity within her social circle. On October 1st of that year, when she asked Eva if two friends, Jillian and Kate, could come over for a sleepover, her mother readily agreed. That afternoon, the friends arrived at Polly's house and spent the evening there quite contentedly initially. At around 9.45 p.m., Eva decided to go to bed due to a severe headache. Informing the girls of this decision and asking them not to hesitate waking her if necessary, she took two sleeping pills and fell into deep sleep shortly thereafter. It was past 11 p.m. when Eva was startled awake by the screams of her daughter's friends. Both girls informed her that a man had broken into the house and taken Polly. Eva immediately contacted the police and checked on her other, Annie, who appeared unaware of the commotion. When authorities arrived, they began questioning Polly's friends. The girls described that they had been in a room, engaged in activities like picking Halloween costumes and indulging in general playful behavior. At approximately 11 p.m., Polly suggested it was bedtime and her friends agreed. She mentioned fetching an inflatable bed she prepared with her mom so they could all sleep together. Upon opening the bedroom door, they were confronted by a man brandishing a knife. The man did not conceal his face with a mask. Initially, due to the proximity to Halloween, the girls mistook this for a prank and laughed. Realizing it wasn't a joke, they became frightened as the man grew angry at their laughter. He forced them into another room and tied their hands and feet. Inquiring who resided in the house, they all identified Polly as the inhabitant. The intruder then removed pillowcases from nearby pillows, placed them over Jillian and Kate's heads, instructing them to count to a thousand. He assured them he was taking Polly for a brief period, but would bring her back soon. After determining that their captor had left, Jillian and Kate attempted to free themselves. This effort lasted around 30 minutes. Once free, they rushed to inform Eva about Polly's abduction. They relayed this entire sequence to the police and provided a detailed description of the suspect since he didn't hide his face. This enabled officers to create a sketch of the individual for immediate investigation. Evidence at Polly's residence was sparse. Footprints noted were from Polly, her family, and recent visitors only. However, Fibers found on the carpet differed significantly from those within Polly's home. These fibers were later identified as originating from automotive carpeting material. Police examined vehicles associated with individuals known to be at the house recently, yet found no match with these fibers, leading them to conclude that they belonged to the kidnapper's vehicle. A palm print was also discovered, but couldn't be thoroughly analyzed due to technological limitations at that time. This detailed account provided critical insight for law enforcement's pursuit of justice in identifying and apprehending Polly's abductor. Back in 1993, advancements in fingerprinting, DNA analysis, and other forensic techniques were not what they are today. As a result, the found palm print with any database was not feasible at that time. However, 
the print was preserved for future comparisons with potential suspects. In Polly's room, another piece of evidence, a fabric that seemed to be silk, was discovered. It looked like it had been cut scissors from a garment and had a distinctive patterns gynth. Police believed this could aid them in future investigations. Additionally, a hair belonging to an unknown individual was found. Although DNA analysis techniques existed then, they were not yet developed enough to be effectively utilized. The search for Polly became one of the largest searches conducted in the United States up to that point. Around 4,000 volunteers joined the efforts, combing through neighborhoods near her home, vacant lots and large estates in the vicinity. Police attempted to identify drivers who resembled a sketch of the suspect, but were unsuccessful. Officers aimed to find Polly within 24 hours of her disappearance, because finding her alive would become increasingly difficult after that period. The FBI was involved to assist with the investigation, launching their efforts to locate her as quickly as possible. Despite their best efforts, days went by and hope of finding Polly alive started to wane. Police questioned neighbors about any unusual activity on the night Polly was abducted. Several neighbors reported seeing an odd man wandering around the area, but they did not suspect he would kidnap someone from a neighbor's house and thus did not alert emergency services. When police shared a sketch based on descriptions from Polly's friends with these neighbors, they all confirmed having seen the man. Officers also spoke with all the teachers and staff at Polly's school. They aimed to find out if anyone knew the man or had any information regarding Polly's disappearance. Alas, no one had any knowledge and everyone had an alibi for the relevant time period. None of the school staff matched either the sketch or the description provided. The police even compared fibers found in Polly's house with car mats from teachers and staff members' cars, but none were a match. As days turned into weeks, the desperation of Polly's family, authorities, and the public increased. There was a growing fear that the man who kidnapped Polly posed a significant threat to society. This added more pressure on the police to resolve the case swiftly. A reward of $200,000 was offered for information leading to Polly's whereabouts, sponsored by actress Winona Ryder, who held a press conference urging for Polly's safe return. The Polly Class case had another peculiarity. In 1993, internet use wasn't widespread nor utilized by law enforcement for search operations or information dissemination. However, three California residents took it upon themselves to leverage this new technology for the search effort. They posted pictures of Polly, sketches of her kidnapper, and reward details online. Their efforts eventually reached an estimated 25 million people in the US via various internet forums and communication channels. While the FBI hoped this would be pivotal in their investigation, it didn't yield significant leads. Despite heightened publicity and numerous tips, investigators lacked solid leads. Weeks elapsed since Polly's kidnapping. Frustration grew among investigators as they were unable to identify the kidnapper or obtain a DNA match from evidence collected. This sense of helplessness persisted until receiving an unexpected phone call, a turning point that held promise, but quickly evaporated into uncertainty. Mark Klaas received a call from someone claiming to be his daughter, Polly. The girl stated she was at a hotel and that her captor had just stepped out briefly, giving her a chance to reach out. Unfortunately, the call was abruptly cut short before any additional details could be gathered. Mark promptly went to the police to inform them about the situation. At that time, the FBI lacked advanced tools to trace previously made calls. Consequently, they waited for another call, hoping to trace it. A few hours later, a second call came in from the same girl who had first spoken to Mark. After receiving this call, the police traced it and were surprised when it led them not to a hotel, but to a residential neighborhood. When officers arrived at the identified house, they knocked and soon discovered it was a prank. A teenage girl, similar in age to Pauly, lived there, hence the voice resemblance. She explained her friends had dared her. Rather than taking her to the police station, they asked her parents to monitor her activities and cautioned her against making jokes about such serious matters. 
On November 28, 1993, nearly two months after Paulie's disappearance, a woman called the police reporting three suspicious objects on a large piece of land she owned. The police and FBI who arrived on site found critical items related to the investigation. A piece of silk matching one from Paulie's room, ballet ties missing since that night, as mentioned by Eva and duct tape. This discovery led police to speculate that Paulie might be in the vicinity. Further investigation revealed new information. On the day of Paulie's disappearance, this same woman had reported strangers frequently trespassing on her extensive wooded property with only a small house and no perimeter fence. The lack of barriers and signage meant many inadvertently wandered onto her land without realizing it was private property. The woman had numerous intruders, but one incident, in particular, stood out. On the night Paulie was abducted, a man approached her house in his automobile. His car became stuck in the mud. The nanny, who was caring for the woman's son, first saw the man, but refrained from confronting him due to fear. The homeowner also chose not to approach him, noting an angry expression in his eyes. They then contacted the police. When the officers arrived, they questioned the man about his presence on the property. He stated he was unaware it was private property and expressed willingness to leave quickly, but requested assistance freeing his car from the mud. The officers observed that the man appeared very nervous and scared. He was sweating and seemed possibly drugged. At that time, they lacked the means to conduct a drug test, and since he wasn't being overtly aggressive, they had no grounds for arrest. Consequently, they aided him in extricating his car from the mud, and he eventually drove away. This individual's name was Richard Allen Davis. Richard Allen Davis was born in 1954 in San Francisco, California. His childhood was fraught with violence inflicted by his parents. When Richard was 12 years old, his parents separated. His mother completely disowned him and left him with his father. Richard's father proved to be highly irresponsible, often leaving him alone for extended periods. Sometimes Richard stayed with neighbors or relatives when alone at home became untenable. By his teenage years, Richard started engaging in criminal activities, stealing things and getting into street fights frequently led to reform school stints. At 17 years old came a significant turning point in Richard's life. He committed a violent robbery that nearly resulted in severe injury to his victim. Faced with two options by the court, reform school or joining the US Army, Richard opted for military service, but lasted less than two years before receiving a dishonorable discharge due to continued misconduct and poor behavior. As Richard matured, he continued to encounter problems and his criminal record grew significantly longer. Around the age of 20, he received a 15 sentence for robbery and kidnapping. Despite this, he served only one year of the sentence due to parole for good behavior. At that period, Richard was also troubled by another accusation. Many friends believed that he had been involved in the disappearance, a 19-year-old girl named Marlene. Although the police concluded that she had left voluntarily, her close friends were convinced Richard had a role in her disappearance after they attended a party together. These accusations remained unproven and were largely based on rumors. When Paulie disappeared, Richard was on probation and did not have a specific address. In response, the police issued a special bulletin exclusively for officers, urging them to exercise extreme caution. They withheld information from the media to prevent Richard from potentially fleeing California or even leaving the country. Ultimately, on November 13, 1993, Richard was arrested while driving under the influence of alcohol following a routine traffic stop by an officer. He failed a breathalyzer test. Upon inspection of his identity and photograph, the officer quickly realized that this was the individual linked to the polyclass kidnapping case. Proceeding with care, the officer informed Richard that he was being arrested for violating his probation due to drunk driving. Without resistance, Richard agreed and was taken into custody. Once at the police station, officers read him his rights and disclosed that he was actually being detained for Polly Class's kidnapping. During an extensive interrogation session, Richard eventually admitted to abducting Polly. 
the police speculated that his confession might have been made under duress. Evidence collected included his palm print, which matched one found at Polly's house perfectly. Carpet fibers from Polly's house were identical to those in his car's carpet as well. Polly's friends were brought in for questioning at the police station, where they unequivocally identified Richard as her abductor, stripling closure to their distressful ordeal. Another piece of silk, identical to the one found in the girl's room, was also discovered in his car and on the property of the woman who had contacted the police. Everything was against him, so he finally decided to confess. He mentioned that he had been using illegal substances with friends that day and was not feeling well. He made the decision to break into a house in a certain neighborhood to commit a burglary. Richard drove around for some time before arriving in Polly's neighborhood. He noticed an open window in a house and decided to climb in. According to him, he did not plan anything, never saw Polly, never saw her family, nor followed them. Once inside the house, he looked for valuables but found few items of interest. Just as he was about to leave, Polly opened the bedroom door and saw him. Richard observed that Polly appeared very frightened so he ultimately decided to take her with him. He stated that he put Polly in his car, began driving, and after a while stopped at a vacant lot. There, he violated Polly. Following this incident, he resumed driving. When the woman and babysitter saw Richard on private property, Polly was still in the back seat of his car. When police officers helped him pull his vehicle out of the mud, Polly was still alive. This caused much frustration among law enforcement personnel who believed her life could have been saved. Afterwards, Richard said he drove down the highway where he strangled Polly, dug a grave and left her body there. On December 4th, 1993, Richard informed police about the precise location of the grave where they began their search efforts. Two months and three days after her kidnapping, Polly Klaas's body was located on the side of a highway in a grave dug by Richard himself. Forensic examination revealed little additional information. It confirmed that strangulation was indeed the cause of death, as stated by Richard. Further details could not be determined with precision. However, it is understood that her death occurred roughly around the time she disappeared. Given all the evidence, the man was put on trial for kidnapping, murder, and rape of Polly Klaas. During the trial, Richard had a chance to speak. He not only apologized to the family, but also made a serious accusation against Polly's father, claiming he abused her. Richard stated that she said to him, don't do to me what my father does to me. This caused Polly's father to yell and almost stand up to hit him, though he was restrained by others. The defendant's words shocked everyone present, not just because of his accusation and lack of genuine apology, but also because no one believed Polly's father had done such things. Although it wasn't proven, Polly's former partner even defended him. On June 18, 1996, Richard was found guilty of Polly Klaas's kidnapping and murder. In August of that year, he received a death sentence. He attempted to challenge this sentence but failed. Then in 2006, after overdosing on pills in his cell, he was found unconscious but revived and sent back to prison. In 2009, his lawyer tried appealing his conviction to the Supreme Court but was unsuccessful. The Supreme Court confirmed that he should be executed. Richard's attorney mentioned plans for further appeals. As a result of these continued appeals, Richard has remained on death row for several years without being executed. There is hope that once all appeals are exhausted within the next few years, the execution will proceed as planned. Hello friends, welcome to my channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case, the case of Brett Ryan. Brett grew up in a prosperous and large Canadian family. His parents, Bill and Susan, had four sons. Brett's parents tried to teach him through their own actions. His father held a prestigious job at the Toronto Star Daily newspaper and had various hobbies like sports, yoga, and psychology. Likewise, Susan was very hardworking. Their entire household rested on her shoulders. She not only devoted time to her husband and children, but also managed the huge house in Toronto's prestigious area without any help from gardeners or craftsmen. 
Just like his older brothers, Brett went to university after high school. He always aimed to be better than his siblings, so he advertised painting services in a local newspaper for Toronto residents' houses and fences. Initially, things went well. He made his first earnings, and Susan was proud of him, often using him as an example for others. However, making money as a part-time job is one thing. Dropping out of university to spend all your time inhaling paint fumes without proper education is another matter altogether. After some time in university, Brett decided to drop out. For the first couple of years after this decision, Brett still felt confident compared to his older brothers. After a while, when Christopher and Leland graduated and found jobs in their fields, Brett's authority began to fade. Christopher started working for the City of Toronto Transit Commission and Leland, the family artist and designer. Following their studies, they moved out of their parents' home. Brett, to avoid spending part of his earnings on rent, stayed with his father, mother and younger brother who attended a school for gifted children. With each passing year, Brett grew more desperate due to his mounting debts and his inability to pay them off. He developed depression. By 2007, when Brett was already 26 years old, his debt had ballooned past $60,000. Although Brett was considered an intelligent individual, he did know how to effectively use his mind. He always put on a cheerful face and helped everyone around him. He was a participant in volunteer initiatives. Consequently, no one could fathom the depth of despair within him. Eventually, a fateful moment arrived when nothing could be done. On October 28, 2007, Brett had no work orders for house painting or any other tasks around the house. Orders were always scarce in the fall, since everyone typically painted their houses in spring or summer. With winter approaching and no prospects for earnings, there was no time to wait. Brett donned all the old clothes he had in his closet, a hat, a long sweater from his older brother, and a scarf knitted by his mother. This particular scarf was comically long. Brett hadn't worn it before, but now found it useful. He wrapped it around his face, leaving only a narrow slit for his eyes, and headed for the bank located on the outskirts of his neighborhood. Clutching some thick folder, Brett waited for his turn at the bank. When an employee finally summoned him, he approached her and quietly informed her that he had a gun with him. He instructed her to take all the money out of the bank's cash register and give it to him. The girl, shaken with trembling hands, handed him all the, ca the cash from the register. Brett then quietly exited the building to avoid drawing the attention of the guards. Once outside, he ran. Upon counting the stolen money, he realized it amounted to just over a thousand dollars. This sum was far from sufficient to clear his debts. He calculated that robbing about 60 banks would be necessary to meet his financial obligations. Despite how improbable that seemed, Brett saw no alternative. In the initial days following the robbery, Brett was consumed with fear that the police might track him down. To avoid detection, he refrained from going home and informed his mother that he had a job in a neighboring town. Instead, he spent nights in his car, cautiously approaching his house periodically to check if any police cars were hidden nearby. Each visit confirmed silence and no signs of pursuit. This reassured Brett that his plan was working. The success of the first robbery led to more, a second, a third, and a fourth. Each time, Brett took precautions to change his appearance by wearing different clothes, purchased secondhand, or even retrieved from trash, and burning them afterward. He also invested in a fake beard from a costume store, since bank employees always mentioned his beard in their testimonies. News outlets in Toronto began covering stories about the bearded robber, but despite this notoriety, he never managed to gain substantial amounts through these crimes, the most being just $3,000 per robbery. Brett's hit a snag when police identified his vehicle on surveillance cameras and traced it back to his residence. Lacking solid evidence for an arrest, law enforcement decided simply to monitor him closely. For about 15 days following this new development, Brett refrained from further robberies, even though no more than three or four days typically passed between crimes before this. 
His unusual hiatus led some officers to believe they were tailing an innocent person and wasting resources on a dead end. But then fortune turned in favor of law enforcement. Brett left the house, got into a car, and later exited not far from the bank. Wearing a different and unusual outfit, he entered the branch and remained there for some time. Upon leaving, he was immediately apprehended by the police, who announced that the much-discussed bearded robber had finally been caught. Brett had been under investigation for seven months and was charged with armed robbery. Interestingly, despite having a gun permit, the bearded robber always entered the bank unarmed. He did not even carry a kitchen knife. In total, Brett faced 19 charges and was subsequently imprisoned. Brett and his family filed multiple appeals, which led to only eight of the 19 counts being upheld. However, Brett didn't stop there. At the first opportunity to apply for parole, he submitted a petition. In it, he requested consideration of his severe depression caused by two failed relationships and substantial debt. Additionally, he emphasized that he committed these crimes without intending to harm anyone and without carrying any weapons. His remarks were taken, however, to secure early release from prison, he had to undergo sessions with a psychologist. These sessions had a positive impact on Brett's behavior and mindset while incarcerated. During this period, he did not communicate with his family, but eventually took steps to mend those relationships. The positive changes in Brett were recognized by the commissioners overseeing his case. Consequently, on November 24, 2010, Brett was released from prison. Nonetheless, this hard-won freedom turned out to be more challenging than anticipated. Before becoming known as Brett the bank robber, he was simply a painter burdened with personal struggles. Post-incarceration life proved difficult. Few companies were willing to hire an ex-convict with such a tainted background. Even when hired for house painting services, clients would cancel upon recognizing him as the infamous bearded robber. The social repercussions extended to his family as well. Neighbors who once praised Susan's garden began spreading unpleasant rumors about them. The Ryan family decided to sell their house hastily and move to Scarborough, where Susan started cultivating her new garden afresh. Despite these challenges, Brett managed to find employment at a trading company. However, his salary was modest. His parents also assisted financially in helping him rebuild his life and continue his university education. Brett continued to see a psychologist. Each session, the specialist advised him not to sever ties with his family. The psychologist's advice proved effective. However, Brett's financial situation remained precarious. Then, in September 2011, a significant positive event occurred in his life. He met Kristen Baxter. Kristen was an exceptional girl. She owned an apartment with windows that offered stunning view of the sea which provided the young couple with a picturesque landscape to enjoy. She was also athletic, maintaining excellent physical condition. Crucially, she was unconcerned about Brett's past. As a couple, they traveled periodically and had even visited Australia. Brett's parents were delighted to observe his relationship with Kristen flourish. They were confident that Kristen would encourage him to advance in life and secure his place in society. Life seemed to improve for Brett until his father passed away. This loss profoundly affected him and triggered a return of depressive symptoms. Consequently, he had to increase his visits to the psychologist and spend time supporting his mother, both emotionally and financially, despite his limited resources. Realizing that their relationship needed to advance beyond casual dating, given their maturity, Brett decided to make a commitment to Kristen. He had saved some money and discussed his intentions with his mother. He expressed his desire to propose to Kristen, the goal being a memorable proposal she couldn't refuse. Understanding her son's intention, Susan provided additional funds for him to purchase an engagement ring. Notably, the couple had previously discussed their future together, and it was clear that Kristen did not require an extravagant gift or similar symbols of commitment. Brett's proposal to Kristen meant the world to her, signaling his serious intentions. Despite this, he decided to go the extra mile and purchased a gold ring adorned with a sizable diamond for his beloved. 
Naturally, Kristen accepted his proposal. From there, they began planning their wedding. Brett with all of Kristen's decisions, nodding in approval. However, the rising costs and financial implications unsettled him. He started worrying about his career prospects and financial stability. Determined to secure a stable job, Brett found an engineering position at a prominent tech company online. He meticulously prepared his resume and applied for the job. To his delight, he was invited for an interview and subsequently received a job offer. Elated by the news, Brett shared it with Kristen and his mother. Eager to make a good impression at his new job, he asked his mother for money to purchase an expensive suit. As always, she didn't refuse him. Yet, just when everything seemed perfect, Brett received a disappointing call from the company. Their security team had uncovered details of his criminal past, leading them to rescind their offer. This news hit Brett hard. It was like a bolt from the blue. His spirits dropped immediately. Frustration set in as he considered the futility of ongoing interviews, each ending in rejection due to his past. Faced with repeated setbacks, Brett decided that rather than continuing with futile efforts and investing time in studies that seemed pointless due to his tarnished record, he would use the funds allocated for university studies on their wedding instead. Brett thus found himself back where he had recently escaped from, but kept certain truths hidden from loved ones, including dropping out of university and being rejected from the engineering role. He maintained appearances by dressing in professional attire each morning before heading to paint houses, changing clothes en route. To further sustain this facade among friends and family, Brett frequently updated social media profiles with pictures seemingly originating from an office environment or business events, images sourced off the internet, and would even pretend he's resolving urgent work-related matters during family gatherings by faking phone calls regarding work issues. In September 2016, after a five-year relationship with Kristen, Brett sought to plan a wedding. He demonstrated a remarkable ability to conceal his true situation, successfully creating the illusion of a stable life. Despite being a common painter, he projected an image of success and prosperity. Brett agreed to rent an expensive restaurant, requiring $100 per guest. The entire Ryan family was thrilled seeing Brett's apparent transformation, a prestigious job, a fancy apartment, and an attractive bride. However, the truth of Brett's deceit was far more complex. With the wedding just a month away, Brett needed funds for the event. He repeatedly borrowed money from his mother until she could no longer assist him financially. Desperate, he even demanded that she seek higher paying employment. Planning his party for August, he invited all his friends and brothers. As the pressure mounted, Brett confided in his counselor about his deceptions. He had been lying to his family for a year about working as an engineer at a technology company. The psychologist expressed deep disappointment and advised Brett to come clean to his mother. Though reluctant, Brett eventually told his mother the truth. Her devastation was profound. She had spent years boasting about her wonderful son, she insisted that Brett also confess everything to Kristen, or she would do it herself. His brothers were already aware of the lies and supported their mother's stance. Unable to face telling Kristen the truth himself, a shocking task after barely managing to reveal it to his mother, Brett found himself in an untenable position as the wedding approached. He knew that informing Kristen would prevent the ceremony and considered if honesty might have been better. Facing pressure from all sides, Brett still couldn't admit the truth to Kristen and feared his mother might do so before long. Each time Kristen's phone rang, he tensed up until realizing it was not her discovering the secret, but rather another friend discussing wedding plans. Desperate for resolution and unable to handle the mounting stress any longer, he needed a final solution. He was forbidden to use firearms so the boy decided that the best way to carry out his plan was to use a crossbow. Besides, it's quite a silent murder weapon. One of his late father's hobbies was bow shooting in the at targets. He taught Brett how to. Yes, was good at target shooting, though it was unlikely his late father thought his son would that skill in such manner. 
Brett bought crossbow and arrows at a sporting goods store and hid it behind the construction debris lying in Susan's garage. At home, he arranged what he thought was an ingenious alibi invention. He tied a spoon to a fan and set the fan on a timer. When the timer went off, the fan turned on and the spoon moved across the computer keyboard, sending pre-prepared comments to YouTube. From an outsider's perspective, it must have seemed like Brett had spent all day at home watching videos and commenting on them. On the morning of August 25th, Brett dressed in strange clothes that hid his face, left the house through the back door to avoid security cameras, and took a train to his parents' house. His aim was to eliminate anyone who might disrupt his and Kristen's well-being once and for all. Susan was very surprised at her son's unexpected arrival. She had not been feeling well that day. But Brett, despite his mother's condition, began once again to persuade her, and even demand, that she not tell his future wife anything. The mother categorically refused him. Then Brett began to get angry. Susan sensed something wrong seeing her son's mad eyes, and warned him that she had already called Christopher, and he was on his way. Brett went berserk. He ran to the garage to get a crossbow, but found that his anger and adrenaline overflowed him with such force that he couldn't even make a shot. Instead, he bludgeoned his mother with the butt of the gun, and finally ensured she was dead by tightening a rope around her neck. After throwing plastic bags over the body, Brett loaded the crossbow with arrows and hid in the bushes, waiting for his brother to arrive. After a while, Christopher arrived and started calling for their mother or brother, but received no response. Only an arrow shot from behind, which pierced his neck, causing him to die within minutes. The next victim was Alexander, their youngest brother. As it turns out, Susan had managed to call him too before everything happened. He was also shot in the neck, but either the arrow did not penetrate deeply or it missed vital arteries. Thus, Alexander did not die immediately, but began to scream and call for help. During this time, Leland was in the house, sleeping in his room on the second. He had no idea of the carnage occurring in the garage and garden, much less that his own brother was committing the crime. Leland's sleep was disturbed by a scream. Coming downstairs, he saw Brett trying to strangle Alexander. A fight broke out between Leland and Brett. As soon as Leland gained the upper hand and managed to push Brett aside, he ran to the neighbors and called the police. Brett stayed in the house. He had nowhere to run. He realized this was the moment he had completely ruined his life. With nothing else to do, he took out his phone and wrote Kristen a letter asking her to forgive him. When the police arrived at the crime scene, they saw a bloody Brett sitting next to his equally bloody but still alive brother Alexander, who would later die in the hospital. Brett himself asked the policeman to handcuff him and take him to the station where he confessed everything. Brett also informed them that his mother's body was hidden under packages in the garage but it was impossible to help her. At both the police station and later at trial, Brett admitted that he did not intend to kill Susan. His plan was merely to scare her. However, he did plan to kill Christopher and Alexander that day since they were witnesses. And if they hadn't arrived, they would still be alive. Almost 10 years ago, he tried justifying everything with his depressive state, but it did not soften his sentence. Despite acknowledging that Brett confessed everything on his own accord and did not hinder the investigation in any way, the judge sentenced him to three life terms, one for each murder, with parole eligibility in 2041. As for Leland, he is not speaking to reporters, but is known throughout Toronto as the sole survivor of that dreadful incident. Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Liga Skraman. India is the only country in the world where cultural and religious traditions have not been interrupted since ancient times, which is probably why it attracts tourists from all over the planet. But in our story, we will look at India like a coin that has a different image on each side. On April 20th, 2018, at dawn, two young men went fishing down the river toward a mangrove forest. They took a long boat ride downstream until they reached a remote and quiet place. 
One of them jumped into the water to tie up the boat, but his attention was distracted by a pungent, acrid odor that was very close by. They went ashore and followed the odor. Curiosity led them to a horrifying find. There was something that looked like a human body hanging on a tree branch and a skull lying nearby. The guys abandoned the boat and rushed to the nearest village to report the terrible find. A team of investigators, forensic experts and police officers urgently arrived on the spot. The experts confirmed that the suspended body was indeed human. It was obvious that it had been hanging for a long time and had already begun to decompose. The flesh on the arms and legs had torn off and the skull was found nearby. Next to the body were packs of cigarettes, packaged drinking water and a lighter which probably belonged to the victim. An investigation was conducted at the scene the same morning. The evidence found was seized, and the remains were sent for examination. The modest remnants of clothing that could be identified on the victim revealed that Liga Skromene, a 33-year-old hiker, was the victim of an accident. But who is Liga Skromene, and what happened to her on the riverbank? Liga Skromene was born in Latvia in 1986. She grew up in a large and friendly family had an older brother and a younger sister. The sisters were very friendly and from childhood shared all joys and hardships with each other. Growing up, Liga moved to Ireland but always maintained close relations with her family. It was in Ireland that she met Andrew Jordan. It was not love at first sight, as the modest Liga had difficulty in communicating with new people. But after five years, Liga and Andrew turned into a married couple who made great plans for the future. Despite the fact that Liga worked in a hotel and led a modest lifestyle, she dreamed of opening her own center of yogic retreats in Portugal. Andrew supported his beloved's idea, and together they saved money for four years to fulfill their dream. But fate had other plans. In early 2018, Liga was experiencing the effects of an aggravated skin disease that was causing physical and mental discomfort. To help her sister overcome this ailment and restore her emotional state, her sister Ilza invited Liga on a trip. So in February 2018, Liga and Ilz traveled to Thiruvananthapuram, the capital of Kerala, so that Liga could receive Ayurvedic treatment for depression. Kovalam is the premier Ayurvedic resort of Kerala in India. Kovalam, which means grove of coconut palms in Hindi, is a small village offering everything you need for a comfortable and complete rest and treatment. Ayurveda is the oldest system of medical knowledge, which originated more than 5,000 years ago. Ayurveda is based on the universal laws of nature, on the unity of all things in this world. Ayurvedic programs help a person to restore balance and harmony in the body. Panchakarma is the best Ayurvedic program for modern man in Kerala. Panchakarma helps to reboot the body effectively. Most of those who have undergone the Panchakarma course in Kerala repeat it annually, and it is not without reason, as regular Panchakarma not only allows us to get rid of extra pounds, but also adds a couple of decades of healthy life. Since 1985, Ayurveda has been recognized by the World Health Organization as the most effective system of alternative medicine in the world. Let us emphasize that all the promised benefits of Ayurveda are only an alternative, not a panacea for healthy longevity. The 33-year-old Liga and her sister came to Kerala in search of spiritual enlightenment, hoping to be cured of depression in one of the Ayurveda centers. Their treatment tour was scheduled for six weeks and included yoga classes, meditation, therapeutic herbal drinks, and nutritional and massage recommendations. The sisters were treated together at an Ayurvedic clinic at Kovalam in Kerala and have already completed their course. On the morning of March 14th, Liga refused to go to yoga class with her sister, explaining that she had a headache. When Ela returned to her room, Liga was not there. With the help of the hotel staff, Liga was able to find out that her sister left the hotel around 11.30 a.m. wearing leggings and a yoga t-shirt hired an auto rickshaw, and went to Kovalam Beach for a walk. The beaches around Kovalam are popular destinations for both domestic and international travelers. The sandy beaches of Kovalam are always crowded. However, Liga could not be found there. 
Liga wandered the beach until late at night, showing her sister's picture, but never heard the long-awaited response that someone had seen her. This was actually strange, as Liga was a tall white girl who definitely stood out, and if she was actually on the beach, someone should have seen her. After searching unsuccessfully, Isla went to the police station to report her sister missing. However, the Indian police officers did not show any sympathy for the missing foreign tourist. On the contrary, they complacently asserted that they would surely find the girl who had strayed, or that she would surely return the next day. They were not even deterred by the fact that Liga, according to her sister, had psychological problems and could be an easy target for criminals. The police registered a case, but the investigation started coldly, or rather, it is more correct to say, did not start at all. Liga had traveled extensively in Kerala, visiting Kolam, Varkala, and finally came to Kovalam. She considered herself a very experienced traveler in India, and this time, she took her sister with her to show her the India she loved so much. But the trip turned tragic. After a few days of inaction by the Indian police, Liga started searching on her own. She enlisted the help of friends and also reported Liga missing to her husband, Andrew, who flew urgently to India. The police investigation intensified after the missing person's husband, Andrew Jordan, and Liga contacted the local press and started an online campaign to find her. Liga also reached out via Twitter to India's foreign minister, Sushma Swaraj. Please help, my sister, a Latvian citizen, has been missing for eight days. We are very worried, she wrote. The desperate sister announced a reward of 100,000 rupees to anyone who could help find Liga or provide any information about her movements that day. Liga and her friend Alexa, who had also traveled to India after hearing about Liga's disappearance, put up posters in the Kovalam beach area where Liga was last seen. Together, they put up flyers and distributed them to people. Numerous locals took an active part in the search for the missing tourist. The important fact remained that Liga suffered from depression and had a hard time interacting with strangers. On the day of her disappearance, she hired an auto rickshaw to reach the beach and was never seen again. She had about 8,000 rupees with her, but no passport, so she could not leave the country. Ashok Kumar, head of the local police station, said that the police had no leads in the case. The police kept saying that the tourist had gone on a bender or eloped and would soon return on her own. However, regular, persistent requests for help from Liga and Andrew forced the police to search for Liga. The search operation was conducted in the Kovalam Beach area where Liga Scani was last seen. Police assumed that she had drowned just as the unidentified body of a woman was found washed ashore at Kachal in Kanyakumari district. Investigators examined the body along with the missing woman's sister, but the latter did not identify it as her sister. The version of drowning was not confirmed and the search for Liga continued. Andrew, on the other hand, was convinced that his wife had been kidnapped by local gangs for the purpose of selling her. He tried to infiltrate these gangs to get more information, but was exposed and warned that repeated contact with the gangs would result in him having to leave the country. A month after Liga went missing, there was still no leads to help find the girl. Liga continued to look for her sister. She visited Kovalam Beach every day and watched people. On one such day, she spotted a boat, and she had a theory. The only way to leave or leave the beach unnoticed was by boat. On April 17, 2018, after a forced hiatus, Andrew returned to India to continue his search. Liga and Andrew entered a new struggle to find Liga Skromana, but her body was still not found. The search was complicated by the fact that Liga was a tourist and a citizen of another country. The Latvian foreign ministry said the embassy was in constant contact with Liga's relatives and was also working closely with the Indian police. The Latvian embassy also appealed to the Indian foreign ministry with a request for special support in the search for Liga, as well as the honorary consul of Latvia in India, whose consular district includes the region where Liga disappeared. At the request of the Kerala state government, the Indian Navy and Air Force joined the search for the missing Latvian citizen. 
the search operation involved an AN-32 transport plane, Gemini inflatable boats, underwater sonar, and five deep-sea divers. But even this extensive effort did not bring the desired result, and Liga remained missing. The search continued, and by this time, all local residents knew about the missing tourist from Latvia. They supported and sympathized with Andrew and Liga. On April 20th, 2018, Liga's phone received the longest awaited yet most horrific call of her life. A body had been found in the mangrove jungle. She and Andrew drove to the designated spot where the police were waiting for them. For the boat crossing, Liga's heart was pounding like never before. She felt that for the moment, she would have to swim the path that Liga had traveled to her demise. On the spot, horror overwhelmed her. Liga saw her sister's clothes. She recognized the shirt and leggings on the body, but the jacket and shoes did not belong to Liga. It remained unclear how, with whom, and why Liga had gotten to a place that could only be accessed by going through Panator from Samudra Beach. Two women confirmed that they had witnessed Liga traveling alone into the mangrove forest. But why would a girl who was being treated for depression and already alone take a boat to a remote place in the forest? The body was shifted to the medical college hospital where it underwent an autopsy, which was captured on video camera. The police said they could not confirm the identity of the body until DNA analysis was completed. According to the city police commissioner, the body was badly mutilated, with the head lying nearby. Police tentatively identified the dead woman as missing tourist Liga Scrumain. In favor of the investigators' conclusions is also the fact that Liga's relatives identified the victim by her hair and clothes. One of the versions put forward by rescue services in India was poisoning. There are poisonous pong pong trees in the mangrove forest, and she could have accidentally or intentionally eaten their fruit and poisoned herself. Between 1989 and 1999, more than 500 people died from poisoning by its fruits in Kerala alone. However, this theory seemed nonsensical because the person was found hanging upside down, but there was no head. It is obvious that if Liga had been poisoned, her body would have been in a completely different position and the head would have been in place. The Indian authorities were talking utter nonsense. Based on the information about Liga's complex psychological problems, the investigators also considered the possibility that Liga had voluntarily taken her own life. Liga feared that the police would try to pass off her sister's murder as a voluntary departure from life. Although a rope had been found at the scene, and it could be concluded that the hiker had hanged herself, Liga demanded a separate explanation for the missing head. Don't tell me it's lost, Liga said sarcastically in yet another appeal on the internet. Breathlessly, Liga and the anxious public waited for the results of the forensic tests. The forensic results were overwhelming. The report stated that there were areas of blood pooling in part of Liga Scraman's brain, as well as bruising in the neck area. The autopsy revealed that the woman had been strangled by several people and was killed in an attempted violent attack. There were external injuries on the body, probably sustained during the struggle. However, the fact of violence could not be definitively confirmed as the body was in the decomposition stage. There were characteristic injuries on the cartilage in her throat, which indicated that someone had forcefully squeezed her throat. The trauma was severe enough to be fatal, according to forensic experts. There were blood clots in her brain, which confirmed strangulation. They also noted that there were bruises on her neck and legs. A total of nine wounds were recorded on Liga Scramani's body. In view of the above, the police no longer considered the version of voluntary death. According to the autopsy, it was determined that Liga was murdered after resisting or struggling. Ilzi breathed a sigh of relief and hoped that the police would soon find her sister's killers. But there were complications as well. As part of the investigation, the police began checking out local drug dealers and card players. In addition, during interviews with local residents, two women said that they saw Liga walking alone to the place where her body was later found, but the police said they did not fully trust their words. Meanwhile, 
Liga's relatives have accused Indian police of incompetence, claiming that if the girl had been searched for immediately, the tragedy could have been avoided. The 33-year-old Latvian tourist is believed to have been grabbed from a nearby beach and transported by boat before being strangled. A special team of investigators has begun looking for those responsible for the crime. About 40 suspects were interviewed. However, arrests were planned to be made a few days later after the law enforcers had enough evidence. The Indian police conducted an investigation that led to the arrest of two men who were eventually accused of killing Liga Skrimine. Police revealed that Liga Skrimine was lured by two men who then abused her before dismembering her body. The alleged assailants, who are now in custody, are local dealers in illegal substances. The suspects fully confessed under torture. Both the accused were pimps and were also dealing in illegal substances, police said. The autopsy did not reveal much evidence because Liga's body was badly decomposed. Andrew Jordan filed a petition in Superior Courting for a review of the felony murder case. He believed that more people were involved in the woman's murder. In the petition, he pointed out that both defendants later recanted their pleas of guilty to the crime. According to Jordan, the men may have confessed because they were tortured, which as it turns out, is a common practice in India. However, the Supreme Court of India denied the murdered woman's common-law husband, Andrew Jordan, a review of the case due to lack of direct evidence. The trial was postponed for two months, but Andrew was outraged by this attitude of the authorities. He had earlier accused the Kerala authorities and police of incompetence and attempts to cover up Liga's murder so as not to scare away tourists. Both the suspect's lawyers asked for and got a postponement by law. They have the right to postpone the case once without giving any reason. The more they postponed, the more he was convinced the case was unclean. However, both suspects were in custody. Investigation revealed that 32-year-old Umesh and 28-year-old Udayakumar offered Liga Scani weed, and when she was drugged, they used it and then strangled and decapitated her. It is noted that the two men apprehended for the murder of Liga Scram had previously committed similar crimes on numerous occasions. Both of them worked for a food delivery company in the Kerala capital and earned money as illegal tour guides in their spare time. Umesh and Udayan have been charged with destruction of evidence, murder, poisoning, kidnapping, and rape. The place where Liga's corpse was found had earlier served as a pleasure ground for Umesh. He used to take men there. Thirteen criminal cases have been filed against him, including six for sexual assault and one for attempted murder. Several of Umesh's victims have testified against him. Liga Scran, along with both men, was seen in the area by several people. They were initially silent but confessed to everything after the body was found. The detainees confessed to police that they committed the murder while attempting violence. They were apprehended but had previously claimed that they had only seen Liga Scran in Kovalam. The men pleaded guilty after repeated interrogations. On December 6, 2022, the court finally sentenced both men to life in prison. The court also recognized that the criminals must pay compensation to Liga Scan's sister, Ilsa, 65,000 rupees each. We would like to note that there has been a whole series of such crimes in this country recently. Young girls are regularly subjected to violence. The problem of crime in India is very acute due to the huge number of sexual acts against minors. The government has introduced the death penalty. It is also worth noting that if the relatives, and primarily Liga's sister, had not been persistent, had they not involved the press by organizing a press conference and an influential MP, it is obvious that the local police would hardly have seriously investigated the case. At first, a theory was put forward that Liga had allegedly passed away voluntarily, and as it now turns out, this is not the first incident in this very place where Liga was found. After this story, I would like to warn once again all women who are frivolous about the dangers of traveling alone in India. Do not seek spiritual enlightenment in distant, dangerous, and uncharted countries. Take care of yourself. March 14, 2003 the Hobbit Pub, Southampton, England. 
On that evening, everyone at this pub was chilling out. Among them were a girl named Hannah Foster and her friend. Both of them were having a great time there, and when they felt it was getting late, both friends left the pub by 10.50 p.m. Now, since it was quite late at night, Hannah Foster's friend caught a bus from a road named Portswood and headed home. On the other hand, Hannah started walking home because her house was just 800 meters away, roughly 0.5 miles. Three people lived in Hannah's house, her father, Trevor Foster, her mother, Hilary Foster, and her younger sister, Sarah. The Fosters were early sleepers and early risers, so they usually went to bed early. They assumed that their daughter would come home, eat, and then go to bed on her own. However, when Hannah's mother woke up at five o'clock in the morning, she couldn't find Hannah anywhere in the house. Normally, it wouldn't take Hannah more than half an hour to come home, but now several hours had passed. Therefore, Hannah's mother, Hillary, called her daughter, but Hannah wasn't answering any calls. After this, Gradually, Hannah's father and younger sister also come to know about her. Following this, Hannah's father, Trevor Foster, calls the girl with whom Hannah went to the Hobbit pub the previous night, but she tells the same story that I've already told you. After this, Hannah's family also tries to find her themselves, but by now it was already 10.30 in the morning, so Hannah's father starts to worry a lot about his daughter. Because of this, he goes to the Southampton police station and files a missing complaint for him. Now the police start investigating the missing person case from their side and first trace her phone. Well, the good thing was that Hannah's phone was active and the police traced the phone through the mobile towers. Naturally, the location of Hannah's phone was showing approximately 20 to 25 miles away from her home. Now the police reached there within an hour. Where the police found Hannah's phone was the city's recycling center and along with the phone, they also found Hannah's bag there, but Hannah was not found. On March 15th, Hannah is also extensively searched for, but her whereabouts are not found. As they continue the search, March 16th arrives, and Southampton police receive a call from an anonymous man from the outskirts of the city. He informs them that he has just seen a girl's body in the bushes. A police team is dispatched to the location provided by the man. Since the previous day, the police have been searching for Hannah Foster, and they also had her picture. Therefore, the police first compare Hannah's picture with the discovered dead body, and they believe it to be Hannah Foster's. Subsequently, Hannah's family is also summoned, and upon seeing a member of their family in this condition, they become quite emotional. Nonetheless, the body is then sent for post-mortem. The police have to wait for several hours for it. However, when the post-mortem report arrives, it states that Hannah was first written and then murdered by strangulation. However, some traces of the killer's semen were found on Hannah's clothes, and this made the police believe that the case would be solved soon, because DNA would be extracted from the semen and matched with the database to find the killer. But the police's imagination proved wrong when the DNA sample of the killer was not found in their database. Anyway, here the police, losing hope, check Hannah's call details, which leads the investigators to take another step towards solving this case. Actually, Hannah had last called the emergency number 999 from her phone, and the operator had answered the call. The call lasted for 50 seconds. After that, the police reach the operator and collect Hannah's call recording from there. In addition, the operator said, I kept saying, this is emergency helpline, what's an emergency, for 50 seconds, but there was no response from the other end. When investigators enhance the recording of Hannah's call, they realize that she is sitting in a moving vehicle. Additionally, there is a, another faint voice with a South Asian accent. The man asks Hannah questions while she sits quietly, appearing scared and intimidated. After obtaining the call recording, the investigating team accelerates progress in Hannah Foster's murder case. Now, the police also check all the CCTV cameras in the area where Hannah's friend last bid her farewell and caught a bus. After scrutinizing several CCTV footages from that road, the police eventually narrow down to seven suspect vehicles. On the other hand, Hannah's parents are eager to see their daughter's killer brought to justice swiftly. They now also discuss these seven vehicles in public.
In the meantime, on March 26th, Hannah's parents talked to people through a local crime TV show called Crime Watch about those cars. As a result, it emerged that one of the seven suspect vehicles shown on TV was a van belonging to their company, Hazelwood Foods. The supervisor, James Dennis, called in and said that the driver of this van does not have his own vehicle, so he also uses this van to come and go from his home. Furthermore, that night, the driver had gone to deliver on this road. The time and location of the van were exactly where Hannah had started to walk home alone. After that, the police get a good lead for the first time in this case. But the man driving the van was named Maninder Pal Singh Kohli. Upon speaking to the company's supervisor, it was found that on the morning of March 15th, Maninder Pal came to work, but there were some marks on his face, whereas there were no marks on his face the previous day, that is on the 14th. Additionally, on March 15th, Maninder only worked half a day and then took half a day off citing a back pain reason. However, it was only later discovered by the police that Maninder hadn't returned to work since that day. Now, hearing the whole story, investigating officers along with forensic experts arrived at Hazelwood Company. Subsequently, the van driven by Meninder was thoroughly examined by forensic experts, and some traces of semen and blood were found in his vehicle as well. With all this evidence, such as Meninder Powell's disappearance, finding semen and blood in his van, they were pointing fingers directly at him for Hannah's murder. However, apart from this, the police once again scrutinize Maninder Powell's van through CCTV cameras. And it becomes clear from the CCTV footage that Maninder Powell had taken his van to the recycling center on the night of March 14th, and where Herna's body was found, his van had also passed through that road. Maninder Powell had now become the prime suspect for the police. Therefore, the police now embark on the search for Maninder Powell, and first they go to his home address, obtained from the sandwich company where he used to work. There, Meninder Pal's wife and two children used to live, and his wife was a citizen of the UK. But upon reaching there, the police learn something that completely changes the course of the case. In fact, Meninder's wife reveals that he had actually left for India on March 18th because Meninder's mother was very ill. After learning this, it was imperative for the Southampton police to apprehend Meninder Pal in the Hannah Foster murder case but it was equally challenging. And then, amidst all this, when a blood sample is taken from one of Menninder Powell's sons and the DNA is extracted from it, it matches the DNA found on Hannah's clothes and inside Menninder Powell's van. Now, because a son inherits about half of his father's genes, therefore, the DNA of both the father and son is approximately 99.99% identical. It had already been confirmed that Menninder Powell was indeed the real culprit. After that, the police from England contacts India through the government. Now, since Maninder Pal's ancestral home was in the city of Chandigarh in India, assistance is sought from the police there. Subsequently, the Chandigarh police obtained the address of Maninder's house and reached there. Here, the police find out that Maninder Pal had come to meet his mother a few days ago, but after staying there for three to four days, he left. Since then, he has not contacted his home. The police also learn another piece of information from Nanander Pal's family at home that when he was in England, he used to wear a turban and keep a beard. But when he came to India, he got a clean shave and also got his hair cut. Until now, Hannah's parents had also found out about their daughter's killer, and they were also waiting for him to be caught. But now, the Chandigarh police was not giving this case much priority. By this time, the news of this case had not even appeared in the Indian media, so normal people didn't know much about it. As time passed slowly, there was not much progress in the investigation. A considerable amount of time had passed, so Hannah's parents took it upon themselves to catch the killer. Then, about 15 months after their daughter's death on July 10th, 2004, they come to India. At this time, they were only in India for 10 days. After that, they come straight to Chandigarh and speak to the local media there, appealing to catch their daughter's killer, 
Meninder Pal. Apart from this, Hannah's parents had separate pictures of Meninder. In one photo, he had a beard and a turban, while in another photo, he had shaved his beard and cut his hair. It was easy to identify Meninder through these pictures. After this, Hannah's parents waited for a few days. But then they decided to go to Delhi because there are national and international media offices. You and I made a promise that we wouldn't rest until Hannah's killer was brought to Gullah. After this step by Hannah's parents, the news of their daughter's murder spread throughout India within 24 hours. The headline of every newspaper and news channel became Hannah Foster and Maminder Pal. Here, Hannah's parents also arranged a free hotline so that anyone who knew about the murderer could call this number. The Southampton police here announced through a news agency called The Sun that they would give 5 million Indian rupees to the person who provides any information about Maninder Pal. By now, this news had spread like wildfire throughout India. Then, on July 15, 2004, a car driver residing in the city of Darjeeling in the state of West Bengal, India, called a retired police officer whom he knew. Now this police officer had already retired. The driver called the officer and told him, there is a man who has been living here for a few months and his appearance resembles that of Hannah Foster's killer as shown in the news. He started appearing here shortly after Hannah's murder. Upon hearing the driver's words, the retired officer immediately sets out to see this man. The officer remembered Maminder Pal's face because they were following this case through the news channel. Afterwards, when that driver showed the police officer the man, the officer was quite surprised. Then he immediately contacted the local police, and the local police caught Maninder Pal in the bus, going from Kalimpong town to Nepal. Here the police find out that Maninder Pal was planning to flee to Nepal after seeing his news on TV channels and newspapers. Besides, the police also find out that Maninder Pal had changed his name to Mike Davis in West Bengal. In addition to Maninder, there was also a woman on the bus, and then it was revealed that Maninder had remarried after coming to India. Now, Maninder was arrested and brought to Delhi, and during the custody of a few days here, Maninder confessed to his crime. Then he told the whole story of how he murdered Hannah that night. The story was something like this. Actually, on the night of March 14th, 2003, Maninder was parked on that road drinking in his van where Hannah passed by. But when he saw Hannah, bad thoughts started coming to his mind. Afterwards, he forcibly kidnapped Hannah and placed her in the van. Although there, Hannah requested to be released from Maninder, but Maninder paid no heed to her requests. In the meantime, Hannah also called the emergency helpline number, but due to Maninder's presence, she couldn't say anything. This led the call operator to believe it might be a missed dial. Later, Maninder takes Hannah to a deserted area and rapes her. However, after committing the crime, he realizes that if he lets Hannah go alive, she will go to the police and file a complaint. Therefore, Maninder strangles her to death. Then he disposes of Hannah's body where it was found. On March 15th, the next day, Maninder takes half a day off from work under the pretext of a back pain. But he had Hannah's mobile phone and handbag with him, so he dumps them in a recycling bin at the city recycling center. Afterwards, he goes to one of his friends and asks for some money on loan because he had to go to India to meet his sick mother. However, his friend doesn't have as much money as Maninder needed. Then Maninder comes back home and also tells his British wife that his mother is sick in India and he needs to go there and requires some money. Understanding Maminder's need, his wife talks to her father, and on March 17th, Maninder's father-in-law lends him some money. The very next day, Maninder catches a flight to India. However, the excuse of his mother being sick was just a pretext. In reality, Maninder had come to India to escape from the England police. Upon arriving in India, Maninder goes to Chandigarh, his ancestral home, meets his mother, but here he completely changes his appearance. After changing his appearance, Maninder goes to Darjeeling, and after some time he changes his name and marries another woman there, where he starts living thereafter. Now, because neither anyone in India knew about Hannah Foster's murder nor about Maninder Pal, Maninder wasn't caught for 15 months. But then, when Hannah's parents come to India, only then is Maninder caught. 
anyway. After that, Menindo is brought to Delhi, and then on July 28, 2004, giving an interview to a news channel, he confessed his crime on TV. Let's cross the road that is coming up of the mighty pump. My van left parked on that little road that he's walking. Just the quiet loud, I like him, you know, on that road, and that's how I don't give. And then I stop for a way to, you know, a little bit. But upon the whole incident, while confessing, Meminder denies and says, That night I had drunk a lot. I didn't want to kill Hannah, but when I mocked her, then Hannah started threatening to complain to the police. Although I threatened her a lot, but she didn't agree, which led me to kill her. I wrote what we learned that night. But then my mother is very ill in India. I want to work with the eyes low. It is very, very bad upon me, you know, that, that her, you know, that beer, I was probably black, that might be on my hand was, and I done that thing. However, in August 2004, Manager Pal changed his statement. He said, I didn't do all this willingly but it was done to me forcibly. After this statement, Melinder was placed under judicial custody in Delhi, and then the process of extradition to Britain begins. This process takes about three years, but finally on June 8, 2007, the court granted permission for Manander Pal to go to England. Once in England, Hampshire police arrest Manander. Then Menander's blood sample is taken, and it matches 100% with the DNA found from Hannah's clothes and semen obtained from the van. After that, from December 10, 2007, the trial begins in the Winchester Crown Court. Here, Manander appeals not guilty to all the charges against him. Manander said, that night, some criminals broke the window of the van and threw Hannah's body inside the van. Now, because they was drunk to trap me, those criminals forced me to rip Hannah, and they may even force to kill her. Even in court, has the Wood Fruits Company supervisor James Dennis testified, but Nanander said, I borrowed 16,000 euros from James, and he is also under the misconception that I am having an affair with his wife. That's why James is targeting me. Nanander also said, Maybe James hired those three men to frame me and forced me to commit this crime on the night of March 14th. But in the end, when the police investigated Manander Pyle's all statements, it all turned out to be lies. And finally, on November 25, 2008, all the allegations against Manander Pyle were proven. After that, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. Now he will be imprisoned without parole for at least 24 years. At the time of sentencing, he was 41 years old, and he will remain in jail until 2030. Of the 5 million rupees reward offered for catching Meninder Pal, 367,000 rupees were given to the taxi driver who first informed the police about Meninder Pal. With this, the money was divided among 12 other people because besides the taxi driver Jason Lepcha, those people also played an important role in solving this case. However, Jason used that money to buy land and then established a school for disadvantaged children on it, named the Hannah Memorial Academy in Foster's memory. Then, in 2006, when Hannah's parents visited Darjeeling and learned about this, they were very pleased. When these people returned to England, Hannah's parents started a registered charity to help Jason along with other people. This now greatly helps Jason Lepcha's school. So, friends, this was the complete story of the Hannah Foster murder case. The case of Shannon. Christian and Christopher Newsom, the tragic end of two college students. Have you ever heard the saying that hesitation is akin to death? In our story today, this takes on a literal meaning as the negligent delay by police officers cost the lives of two young people. During the subsequent legal proceedings, it was repeatedly stated that the officers followed protocol and waited 24 hours from the time of the missing person's report. However, it was during these critical hours that the couple endured a tragic end under extreme cruelty. The case of Shaman Christian and Christopher Newsom is cited as one of the most notorious and brutal in the history of the United States. It shook the nation twice, first in 2007 when the crimes occurred, and later in 2011 when the sentences handed down to the gang members were challenged and appealed. This complicated legal battle led to the enactment of two laws, 
These laws restrict attorneys and defendants from casting the victims in a negative light and abolish the requirement for a jury's unanimous verdict to be approved by a judge. In this harrowing tale, there were two innocent victims and five merciless criminals, with the motive for the heinous act being a simple robbery. Let's delve into the details of this tragedy, piece together the chronology of those horrific events, understand the role of each participant, and explore whether this tragedy could have been avoided and the young lives saved. Who were Shannon Christian and Christopher Newsom? Hugh Christopher Newsom Jr., commonly known as Chris, was born on September 21, 1983, in Knoxville, Tennessee, to Mary and Hugh Newsom, in a loving, large family. As the youngest child, he was adored by his family. Chris was athletic in his youth, particularly excelling in baseball during his school years. His coach believed he had a bright future in the sport, but a severe injury and a prolonged recovery process ended his promising athletic career. Nevertheless, Chris was a man of many talents. He was an excellent artist, played guitar, had woodworking skills, and was knowledgeable about cars and motorcycles. Dreaming of becoming a mechanic in his youth, Chris's passion for carpentry eventually took precedence. After high school, he attended the prestigious University of Tennessee, where he was a diligent student and ranked among the top of his class. Shaman Gale Christian was born on April 29, 1985, in the Cogdoches, Texas, the younger of two children to Dina and Gary Christian. She was raised alongside her older brother Chase, with whom she shared a close and affectionate bond. Notably, Dina had been diagnosed with infertility in her youth, and the birth of her two children was considered nothing short of miraculous. In 1997, the Christian family moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, where the children attended local schools, and the parents established a small but profitable family business. Dina conducted individual psychotherapy sessions at home. Shannon, sharing her mother's interest in psychology, was outgoing and kind-hearted. After high school, she pursued a degree in sociology at the University of Tennessee and worked part-time to save for her dream of buying a car. Her parents and brother helped her realize this dream on her 21st birthday, contributing towards the purchase of a silver Toyota 4Runner. It was on the university campus in 2006 that Christopher and Shannon met through mutual friends. She was just 21, and he was about to turn 23. It was love at first sight, and the couple became inseparable. Within a month, Chris introduced Shannon to his parents, expressing his desire to spend his future with her. Shannon reciprocated by introducing Chris to her family, who warmly welcomed him. In October 2006, a significant family dinner was held attended by both their parents and siblings. Discussions revolved around the young couple's deep feelings and their plans to marry after graduating from university. Everyone was happy and full of hope for the future, blissfully unaware of the tragedy that would soon befall their families. Vanished on the way to a party. On January 6, 2007, Shaman Christian and Christopher Newsom were invited to a birthday party of a mutual friend. That Saturday, Shannon visited a beauty salon to prepare for the celebration, parking her car in a nearby underground garage where they planned to meet. However, Chris was delayed, leading to a slight argument between them as they were running late for the event. Their friends became increasingly worried when Shannon and Chris did not show up at the party. Known for their responsibility, it was unlike them to miss an event without notifying anyone. Attempts to reach them on their phones were unsuccessful. In desperation, Shaman's best friend repeatedly called her mother late into the night to check if everything was all right, but received no answer. The next morning, Dina, Shaman's mother, realized that her daughter had not come home. Initially, she was not overly concerned, assuming Shaman might have stayed over at Chris's place after the party. Besides, Shaman had a work shift on Sunday, so it was plausible she went straight to work from Chris's place. However, Dina's concern grew when she noticed several missed calls from an unknown number around midnight. Returning the call, she heard Shannon's friend's voice, informing her that Shannon and Chris had not shown up at the birthday party and were unreachable. This instilled fear in Dina, sensing that something terrible might have happened to her daughter and her boyfriend. Neither Shannon nor Chris was answering their phones, and Chris's parents were equally surprised, believing he was staying at Shannon's place. 
Further anxiety arose when it was discovered Shannon had not shown up for work, either. The worried parents immediately contacted the police, but the response was lackluster. The officer suggested the couple might have simply sought some alone time and lost track of it. They also followed the protocol that an adult is considered missing only after 24 hours without contact. But for Shannon and Chris, those 24 hours were critical. Not willing to wait, the parents and friends of the young couple began their own search. They contacted everyone they knew, visited hospitals, distributed flyers with their photos, and set up social media groups appealing for any information about the missing students. Despite their efforts, no useful information surfaced. The last known sighting of Shannon was at the beauty salon she visited on Saturday. According to the hairstylist who attended her, Shannon only talked about the upcoming party and had no plans to stop anywhere else on the way. A gruesome discovery along the railroad tracks. It wasn't until Monday, January 8th, that the police finally began their search for the missing young couple, Shannon Christian and Christopher Newsom. By this time, thanks to the efforts of their parents and friends, almost the entire city was aware of their disappearance. The day before, on Sunday, there were rumors about a horrifying discovery near the railroad tracks, but no concrete information was available. A railroad worker, inspecting the tracks in his assigned area, stumbled upon what appeared to be severely damaged human remains on the embankment alongside the tracks. The body was in a horrific state, with multiple injuries, and had been doused with a flammable liquid in an attempt to burn it. The police, responding to the scene, cordoned off the area and conducted a thorough examination. However, they were unable to find any significant clues or leads. After taking necessary photographs, the remains were sent to the morgue for an autopsy to determine the cause of death and to attempt identification, though it was clear that the extensive damage and effects of the fire would make this difficult. Forensic experts determined that the body belonged to a young man who had suffered a brutal death. The victim had multiple injuries inflicted while he was alive, indicating prolonged and severe assault. Almost all of his teeth had been knocked out or damaged by blows. He had been shot three times, twice in the back and a final, fatal shot to the head. Additionally, traces of seminal fluid from at least three different men were found in his body, along with distinctive tears, suggesting repeated violent assaults. When police checked recent reports of missing young men, Christopher Newsom fit the description in age, height, and build. The officers contacted his parents and requested DMA samples for confirmation, but strongly advised against personal identification at the morgue as the burnt remains barely resembled human features. Unfortunately, the DNA analysis confirmed that the body belonged to the missing student, Newsom. The search for Shannon. Despite the distressing news about Christopher, Shannon Christian's parents still clung to the hope that their daughter was alive, possibly being held somewhere. Her mobile phone was last pinged on the day the couple disappeared in one of Knoxville's more troubled neighborhoods, a place they wouldn't have visited by choice. This indicated that they were likely brought there against their will, and Shannon might still be held in the area. In a secluded alley of this neighborhood, Shannon's Toyota 4Runner was found abandoned. It was in a terrible state, so much so that Dina and Gary Christian hardly recognized their daughter's car. The SUV was dirty, scratched, with broken headlights and deflated tires. All of Shannon's personal belongings were missing from the car, which was littered with cigarette butts and the seats were torn and stained. The driver's seat was pushed far back, suggesting that a large adult male had been the last one to drive it. A crumpled envelope with the address 2316 Chipman Street was found on the floor between the seats, likely dropped by the perpetrator. A local witness reported seeing four African-American males driving the SUV that Saturday evening, a vehicle that stood out in that area. Fingerprints on the envelope led the police to Lamaricus Davidson, previously convicted for serious offenses. His residence, located in an industrial area near a wasteland, lacked witnesses. When no one responded to the police's knock and offer to surrender, they forced entry, hoping to find Shannon alive inside. Inside the house, they found Shannon's purse, a stuffed toy from her car, as well as Christopher's headphones and baseball cap a knife with blood traces, torn and blood-stained fragments of women's clothing, 
and Shaman's lifeless body were discovered in the house's trash chute system, hidden under dirty sheets. She was bound in the fetal position and wrapped in five trash bags. Experts later concluded that she likely passed away in the early hours of Monday, January 8th. This tragic finding suggested that if the police had begun their search immediately after the missing persons report, rather than waiting for 24 hours, Shannon might have been saved. A horrific state of suffering. The condition of Shannon Christian's body was a horrifying sight even for seasoned forensic experts, as there was not a single untouched area on her. Shannon was covered from head to toe with bruises, abrasions, cuts, and cigarette burns. The numerous tears and injuries to her genital area, as well as her oral cavity and throat, indicated that she had been subjected to multiple assaults by several men. Shannon sustained a serious head injury and internal bleeding in the abdominal area, likely resulting from being kicked. Furthermore, the merciless assailants inflicted several penetrating, though not fatal, stab wounds on her and extinguished dozens of cigarettes on her skin. In a brutal attempt to destroy DNA evidence on her body, the perpetrators doused her with household bleach, paying particular attention to bleeding wounds and her genital area. She was also forcibly made to ingest bleach. After these torturous acts, Shannon, still alive, was wrapped in five trash bags and then shoved into a household trash chute covered with sheets and rags. She slowly suffocated and bled to death, helplessly trapped with no chance of escape or calling for help. Five Merciless Perpetrators Lamericus Davidson, in whose house the mutilated body of Shaman Christian and personal belongings of the deceased Christopher Newsom were found, was immediately declared a fugitive. The police also tracked down another suspect, Eric Boyd, whose traces were found at the crime scene. Boyd was apprehended on January 11th without resistance and agreed to cooperate with the investigation, claiming he wouldn't go to prison for crimes he didn't commit. Boyd revealed that Davidson was hiding in a vacant house listed for sale and personally led the police to the location. Davidson, unprepared for this turn of events, was caught off guard and offered no resistance. Notably, at the time of his arrest, Davidson was wearing sneakers that had belonged to the deceased student. During interrogations, Davidson tried to minimize his role, portraying himself as a victim. He claimed that the couple had come to his house looking to buy banned substances but were caught up in a conflict with his acquaintances. Davidson insisted that he left to avoid involvement, and the subsequent brutal acts occurred in his absence. Further interrogations revealed three more individuals involved in the case. Davidson's friend, George Thomas, his half-brother, Latalvis Cobbins, and an 18-year-old woman named Vanessa Lynn Coleman. Once all five suspects were in custody, they were placed in separate cells and interrogated individually. Each tried to deflect blame onto the others, inadvertently revealing details of the heinous crime. Their fragmented accounts helped piece together the event's chronology and each perpetrator's role in the brutal act. A Timeline of Tragic Events Lamaricus Davidson, who had been released from prison on parole just a few months before these events, was desperately in need of money. He was involved in the sale of banned substances and urgently required a vehicle to deliver these to his customers. Davidson decided to steal a car from an underground parking lot, known for its lack of surveillance cameras, and headed there with his accomplices. Tragically, at that moment, students Shannon and Christopher were in the parking lot, arguing over Chris's delay. The criminals, deciding to leave no witnesses, forced the couple into the trunk of a car at gunpoint. The pair was taken to Davidson's house, where they were brutally beaten and repeatedly assaulted. After midnight, a barefoot and undressed Christopher was again forced into the trunk and taken to the railroad tracks. He was ordered to walk on the stones before being shot twice in the back. His torment was ended with a final shot to the head. His body was then doused with a flammable liquid and set on fire in hopes of destroying any evidence that could lead to the perpetrators. Having dealt with Newsom, the criminals returned to the house where Shannon remained bound. She endured horrific cruelty the next day, leaving her without a single uninjured area on her body. The sadists concluded their torture by dousing her with bleach and packing her, still alive, into plastic trash bags, where she slowly suffocated. The exact moment when young Vanessa Coleman joined the group was unclear. During interrogations, 
She claimed to be a hostage herself, participating in the torture out of fear for her life. However, Boyd indicated that Coleman was Davidson's girlfriend and willingly participated in the events, even taking some of Shannon's jewelry and mobile phone. Further, a personal diary found at Vanessa's home contained her descriptions of the horrors at her boyfriend's house, which she referred to as an exciting adventure. The Initial Trials and Sentences During the investigation, it was established that Lamericus Davidson, born in 1981, was the leader of the criminal group and the primary instigator of the brutal acts against the innocent victims. Davidson tried to deflect blame and downplay his role in the atrocities, attempting to shift responsibility onto the deceased themselves. Davidson claimed that the couple came to his house to buy banned substances and later suggested engaging in rough intimacy with him and his friends, a situation he said spiraled out of control. Remarkably, the defendant's lawyers latched onto this version, attempting to tarnish the reputations of the deceased in court. The parents of the victims later expressed immense emotional anguish over these claims. Nevertheless, Davidson was found guilty on 40 counts, including assault, kidnapping, robbery, and particularly cruel and premeditated termination of life, among others. The jury unanimously decided that Davidson deserved the death penalty for his heinous acts. Latalvis Cobbins, born in 1982, faced the death penalty for his role in the torture, assaults, and involvement in the termination of life. However, he was ultimately sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. George Thomas, born in 1983, received a similar life sentence for his involvement in the same crimes, with no chance of release. Eric Boyd, considering his cooperation with the investigation and assistance in capturing Davidson, was sentenced to 18 years of imprisonment. The relatives of both victims found this sentence outrageously lenient. As for Vanessa Coleman, born in 1988, the only female participant in the atrocities, the investigation proved her involvement in the torture, assaults, and in Shannon's tragic end. She was sentenced to 53 years in prison. Overturned verdicts and new hearings in 2011 while the criminals were serving their sentences and Davidson awaited execution, the case took an unexpected turn. The presiding judge resigned, admitting to a substance dependency. His ability to conduct trials was questioned, and his verdicts over the last two years were annulled, leading to new hearings, including the case of Christian and Newsom. A new judge scheduled hearings for all five individuals involved in the student's tragic end. After the retrials, Davidson's sentence remained unchanged. Death penalty. Tobbins continued to serve his life sentence without the possibility of parole. Thomas, however, received a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 51 years. Vanessa Coleman's sentence was reduced from the original 53 years to 35 years. Her appeal in 2014 was rejected, and parole was denied in 2017. In 2020, the parole board decided she would remain incarcerated at least until April 2032. Eric Boyd's situation changed most dramatically. Originally receiving a relatively short sentence for cooperating with the investigation, his involvement in the assaults and tragic end of both victims was later proven. His retrial resulted in a life sentence without parole, with his accomplice, Thomas, testifying against him, revealing previously unknown details about Boyd's role. For his testimony, Thomas, who initially had the possibility of parole after 51 years, had his sentence reduced by 15%, contingent on good behavior. Boyd's attempts to appeal his new sentence were unsuccessful. He is currently serving his sentence in the Bledsoe County Correctional Complex. Davidson remains in the maximum security Riverbend Institution, awaiting the execution of his death sentence. Public Reaction and the Case's Impact As previously mentioned, this trial garnered significant attention, widely covered in the press, and leading to the enactment of two laws. The first was aimed at protecting victims from defamation, attempts to shift blame onto them, and portraying them negatively. This was in response to the defense strategy of the accused and their lawyers, who tried to label the students as drug users and thrill seekers in a troubled neighborhood. These claims were completely false and caused immense pain and suffering to the victims' families. 
the second law eliminated the need for a judge's signature on a jury's unanimous verdict, which, if in place during this case, could have prevented the need for retrials and sentence reviews. The house at 2316 Chipman Street, which became a torture chamber for the young couple, was demolished in the fall of 2008. A memorial was erected on the site in honor of Shaman Christian and Christopher Newsom. In memory of Christian, a golf tournament and a Christian charity foundation were established, providing support to victims of violence. Similarly, a foundation in Newsom's name was created, holding annual memorial baseball tournaments at Halls Park and awarding a scholarship named after the deceased student and former baseball player. It's important to note that, despite the public outcry and widespread attention, the media initially misrepresented details of the case, either accidentally or intentionally. Many believed that the variations in reporting and delayed coverage were influenced by racial motives, as the victims were white and the perpetrators were African American. However, the head of the Association of Criminal Writers and Editors noted, I can't confidently say that this case would have received more attention if five white criminals had been accused of committing similar atrocities against two black individuals. Additionally, the Knoxville police chief stated that there was no evidence to suggest these crimes were committed based on racial animosity. Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Penny McAllister. Penny McAllister, the eldest daughter of Desmond, a teacher and soldier, grew up in Germany, immersed in the arts, music, theater, and school drama. She was a bright, charming young woman. At 16, Penny met Duncan McAllister in the officer's mess bar in Germany. Born in 1961, Duncan had attended UK boarding school and, like his father, joined the army, training in signals. He'd been engaged to a UK woman, but ended it before being posted to Germany, where he met Penny. Dazzled by Penny's beauty, Duncan was rude at first, but later adored her. A few months on, he plucked up the nerve to visit, and they became an item. They fell fast, spending all the time they could together. In 83, Duncan was reassigned to the UK, and before departing, he asked Penny to marry him. They wed the next year, when she was 18, and he was 23. The couple relocated to Wiltshire, with Duncan enrolling at the Royal Military College, while Penny pursued her studies. Their newlywed years were blissful, marked by shared adventures, travel, and a mutual passion for diving learned on vacation. Eventually, Duncan received a posting to Northern Ireland at the height of the Troubles. Penny accompanied him, which was an unusual step, as most British army wives stayed in the UK due to the dangerous and volatile situation. They settled in County Armour, the smallest county in Northern Ireland, home to Loughnay, the largest freshwater lake in the UK and Ireland. In February 1990, Duncan and Penny decided to set up an army diving club to expand their social circle. Duncan was the more confident diver, providing instruction, while Penny handled the administrative work. One of the members who joined to learn diving was a young woman named Susan Christie, a petite soldier and member of the Ulster Defence Regiment, UDR. Susan was the daughter of a non-commissioned officer in the UDR, and it was said that she had her father wrapped around her little finger. She was very driven and planned to follow in her father's footsteps, joining the UDR just before her 21st birthday. She was initially part-time but excelled as she was a perfectionist, which suited army life. She was an attention seeker who flirted skillfully to captivate men, but never went too far. Yet, she'd pout and act like a brat if denied that spotlight. This behavior only intensified when she joined the diving team. Susan flirted with Duncan, a married man, and they began a physical affair. Though Duncan claimed it was just a fling and he loved his wife Penny, their relationship escalated, with Duncan taking Susan's virginity and them meeting for sex in secret. Penny suspected Susan and Duncan's behavior, though she lacked proof. Trusting her intuition, she watched them closely, hoping the situation would resolve itself. However, Penny's optimism would prove misguided, but Susan's behavior around Duncan, particularly in the diving circle, became unpredictable. Susan was jealous of Penny as she treated her horribly. She was rude and would ignore Penny, even if she was to even just say hello. 
It wasn't enough for Susan to have Duncan in the palm of her hand. She would also try and make Duncan jealous if they all went to the pub after a dive and she wasn't sitting next to him. She would flirt with the other soldiers around them. Duncan would describe it as leading them on, and if any of them tried for a kiss or anything more, Susan would run back to him crying, saying she was being harassed. Susan, rightly so, began to get a reputation for throwing accusations around. She also began to fake illness when she wasn't getting the attention she wanted and was treated in hospital a few times when there was nothing wrong with her. In September 1990, a serious incident occurred. Duncan and Susan dived with the club near the wrecked SS Triple, which had sunk in 1917 off County Antrim after hitting a mine. It was a deeper dive than usual. The wreck lay 30 meters down. Duncan, the cautious leader, had all stopped mid-ascent for two minutes to avoid decompression sickness. When they surfaced, he warned that anyone feeling unwell should contact him or a supervisor. Everyone, including Susan, said they were fine. The next morning, Duncan received a call that Susan was, to no one's surprise, unwell. She had joint pains, a symptom of the bends, so Duncan took her to a specialist. Though she could walk to the car and into the clinic, when left in the waiting room, she dramatically collapsed and needed a nurse's attention. The doctor confirmed her symptoms matched surfacing too quickly, but found it curious that Duncan, her diving partner, showed no signs. Despite two compression chamber runs, Susan continued feeling unwell, concerning the doctor. The week before during a training course, and perhaps the pain she was experiencing was from that. Both the doctor and Duncan were furious that their time and energy had been wasted on what was probably a false alarm. But they weren't the only ones. Once pissed off, Penny had been left at home for hours while her husband was attending to the woman she suspected he was having an affair with. Penny was so fed up that she actually called her mother. She didn't tell her mother in so many words what was going on, but her mother would understand how hard it was to live on an army base as she had done it with her own husband and she would be clever enough to read between the lines. Next to a woman's intuition, a mother's intuition is like having a superpower. This was the only second time Penny had opened up about her worries. Last summer, she went to Germany to see a friend and told them about her concerns over Duncan and Susan. She also confided the loss of her pregnancy, but kept it from Duncan due to their relationship troubles. That weekend, Duncan had Susan over while Penny visited her friend in Germany, their first time being together overnight. Susan soon professed her love for Duncan, but he refused to return the sentiment. He brushed her off, confessing he felt unable to express his love due to his loyalty to his wife. He had no issue betraying his wife by getting intimate with Susan, but drawing the line at declaring his love, as that would be too much of a betrayal. The diving club arranged a trip to Ascension Island in October 1990, and at first there was a problem with Penny's flight, which elated Susan. But then Duncan intervened, getting Penny on a flight. This infuriated Susan, who was very hostile towards Penny, who was just trying to ensure a smooth trip. Penny organized the equipment and cooked for everyone, but Susan, in one of her moods, refused to eat Penny's food or help her. Duncan soon realized that Susan wasn't just in love with him, but obsessed. He was stuck dividing his time between the two women. Even though he was a knight with Susan, he still managed to slip away with her a few times throughout the trip. Duncan pulled Susan on her behavior towards Penny. And while he was concerned for Penny over Susan's behavior, he was even more concerned when they actually seemed to be getting on. They would sit together, have long conversations, and get on towards the end of the trip. After the trip, Duncan decided he would have to end the affair with Susan. It was clear by this stage that Susan was dangerous, and if she got close to Penny, she could tell her of the affair and his marriage would be over, and it also put a risk to his career. Duncan told Susan the affair was over, but she was having none of it. She cried and then totally ignored the fact that it was over. On the 2nd of 1990, Susan told Duncan she thought she was pregnant. Upset, he panicked 
couldn't understand how this happened. Susan said she was sick on their Ascension Island trip, but didn't say anything, not wanting to be stopped from diving. When discussing options, Duncan made his views clear, but said it was Susan's decision and he'd support her. The first option was termination. She could have the baby, but he'd be uninvolved financially. Or she could have the baby, name him as the father, but he'd lose his job. Termination was the only option for Susan. She didn't want to raise the baby alone, and she wanted to keep her career. On a while later, Susan told Duncan she was pregnant, but the doctor said it'd be best to wait before arranging an abortion. Abortion was illegal up to 2020, so she'd have had to travel. A month later, Susan announced she'd lost the baby, convenient as she never went to the hospital or took time off work. Duncan stayed in touch that week after Susan lost the baby, trying to console her over the loss. However, Susan later contacted Duncan after meeting up with Penny for lunch. She was very angry with Duncan because she had told Penny about the miscarriage and claimed that she too had lost a baby, fully aware of what Susan was going through. Susan was furious and called Duncan to find out why he had not told her this himself. Of course, he could not have, as Penny had not informed him, and he had not even known she was pregnant. He was devastated that Penny had not confided in him, and he also realized that he could not ask Penny about it. Susan had to go to the UK for a work course in 1991. This helped end her affair with Duncan, as he was also posted to Germany. But they, they still continued seeing each other, much to Penny's annoyance, until Susan made a scene trying to get Duncan to go out with her. The weekend before Susan was to go to the UK, Penny went to Dublin with some army wives. Duncan and Susan would spend that same weekend together, and it would be the last time they would have together, so they made the most of it. They went diving together, went for walks, and, of course, had a bit of housework. Susan was upset that things were finally coming to an end, but told Duncan she was happy they'd remain friends. However, people that gullible think they can stay friends after an affair. After the weekend was over and Penny returned home, Duncan was surprised to receive a call from Susan. He thought that their weekend together clearly signaled that they were over. Obviously, Duncan didn't understand the staying friends bit was Susan's way of holding on. She continued to call Duncan at work and even made plans to meet Penny for a walk and lunch before she left for the UK on Tuesday, the 26th of March, 1991. Duncan received a call from Susan. She asked what could have happened if he wasn't married. This was a risky question with a perilous answer that could lead to dire consequences. Duncan said it was pointless to consider as things are as they are. He noted they'd face other challenges as she's a soldier and he's an officer and their relationship was prohibited in the army even if she was commissioned as she was stationed in Northern Ireland while he couldn't be there long term. Susan agreed and was upset by the truths he shared before ending the call. The following day, Wednesday the 27th of March, Penny dropped Duncan to work and headed into town as she had to drop some stuff off at the army run shop and then later go to meet Susan for their walk with the dogs and lunch out. This morning will be the last time Duncan would see his beautiful wife alive. Penny also had to prepare for a visit from her parents and was busy at home getting things ready. Penny told Duncan she was not looking forward to her lunch days with Susan as she had rescheduled twice already and she was really too busy that day to meet with her but she decided to go anyway. Later that morning, Duncan received a call from Susan asking if he knew where Penny was. She tried ringing the house, but no one answered. She couldn't remember if they were supposed to meet at 11 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. Duncan, exasperated by the call, told Susan to go to the meeting place at 11 and wait there for Penny, then ended the call. Duncan headed out of the office that afternoon known for a fitness test which was a three-mile run. As he returned to the office, he met with his commanding officer, who was not looking too pleased. Duncan thought he was coming to tell him that he was not going to be going to Germany, but instead, he had graver news. He sat Duncan down and told him that Penny was dead. At first, 
Duncan could not take in the information. His commanding officer continued to tell him about the circumstances of Penny's death. It became more real. Penny was out for a walk in John Carra Forest and collapsed with her dogs and was attacked. He was told that there was another woman with her and she was injured and brought to the hospital. Duncan knew straight away who this woman was, but that didn't concern him straight away. He knew Penny's parents were to arrive in a few hours and he would have to break this devastating news to them and also had the ordeal of telling his own parents. The police secured the area where Penny's body was found, and they took witness statements from a family who had been having a picnic nearby. When Susan emerged from the forest, crying, screaming, and bloodied, she was unable to stand properly, and her hands were covered in blood. Her clothes were ripped, and she had scratches on her face and a stab wound to her torso. The woman of the family went to help Susan, and her husband went to call the police. Susan, meanwhile, begged for someone to find Penny. After she explained that they were both attacked by a man, and she had managed to escape, but that Penny was still in the forest, the police arrived and went into the forest. A local doctor treated Susan for her injuries. They followed the trail and soon found Penny lying on the forest floor, covered in blood, and her throat had been cut. This is where she bled out and died. Susan was brought to the hospital and treated for her scratches and stab wound, then sent home. That night, Duncan rang her to see how she was and to ask her what happened. All she kept saying was, sorry, and that she tried to help but couldn't. He agreed to go see her after seeing Penny. Susan offered to go with him and was very insistent, but Duncan said it was something he had to do on his own. The following day, he visited Susan at her home and she again tearfully kept apologizing to him for not saving Penny. Duncan, as usual, believes since Crocodile tears and told her it wasn't her fault. Susan told him what happened. Penny and Susan met up as planned. They went for a walk in the forest on a lovely day. Susan stopped to tie her shoelaces while Penny went ahead with the dogs. Penny's dog started barking furiously and Susan saw a man standing over Penny on the ground. Penny was bleeding, and the man had a knife. The man then attacked Susan, pulling her, knocking her down, and trying to take her clothes. Susan kneed him and then went to Penny's aid. Susan couldn't stop Penny's bleeding, and the man had fled the scene, so she ran to the car park. The attacker was of average height, had brown hair, blue eyes, and was wearing a green jacket, blue jeans, and white sneakers. The police visited Susan's house and requested her to go to the forest where she and Penny were attacked. The police suspected Susan was withholding information, and they were right. Susan and Duncan did not disclose their affair to the police, as they agreed it was irrelevant to Penny's case. They agreed to keep quiet about the affair if the police found out. The police questioned Susan extensively at the station throughout the day, she complained that the officer was not courteous, but Duncan said, that's how they gather evidence. Susan felt she was mistreated and that the police were against her. She told Duncan they would speak to a friend who knew about their affair, which worried him. Duncan tells Susan that the police are searching for a white car and a description of the perpetrator. This is a relief for Susan, since she is not the only one who saw the man she described. Overnight, Duncan thought he should approach the police and tell them about the affair. He also felt it would save time and they would focus solely on finding who killed Penny. Duncan wasted no time in contacting the police, providing them with a comprehensive account. The authorities had little need for further questioning, merely inquiring about his familiarity with Drumkara Forest and Susan's recent visit. Duncan denied knowledge of the former, but acknowledged the latter requesting discretion regarding the army's involvement, which the police stated was not feasible. He was instructed to return to Northern Ireland following Penny's funeral in England. When he arrived in England, his father picked him up at the airport and he told him about the affair on the eve of Penny's funeral. He knew that Susan had been arrested for Penny's murder. Now he had to tell Penny's family about the affair. He called Penny's parents and told them everything. They were kind during the funeral the next day, 
even letting Duncan sit next to them. There are better people out there than some, and I see that with the families of victims, especially the parents. Meanwhile, Susan was being questioned and she had stuck to her story throughout. The police told her that Duncan had confessed to their affair and Susan began to deflect and change her story. Suddenly, she had memory loss and could no longer remember what happened that day in the forest. The police were watching Susan's behavior throughout and noticed that she seemed to like the attention she was getting during the interviews. She ate everything that was put in front of her. She tried to befriend the female officer that was assigned to the case. This was not the typical behavior of someone who had witnessed the brutal murder of their friend and then implicated in us. When questioned, Duncan was asked about his relationship with Susan and whether he and Penny had an open marriage. Police also asked if Penny didn't help Susan in an accident during a dive and if Duncan forced Susan to terminate a pregnancy. Susan claimed that Penny had provoked her that day, causing her distress and a blackout, after which Penny was found dead. Police believed that Susan was withholding the full truth, possibly to cover for Duncan. They also questioned why Duncan had conspired with Susan to cover up the affair unless he had something to do with. Why had he spent two days with this supposed ex-lover following the news of his wife's death? Duncan flatly denied everything, and his statement was prepared, and he was released. Susan was kept in custody, where she quickly adjusted to prison life. Her father visited her, and so did friends, but she never admitted to anyone what she did on June 1, 1992. Susan appeared at Downpatrick Court and pleaded not guilty to murder, but guilty to manslaughter. The Crown's opening statement was damning. They said Susan had lured her lover's wife to a secluded spot and then brutally murdered her. It was a case of premeditated murder. Then she tried to cover up the murder by inventing an attacker and injuring herself. Forensic scientist Joseph Kaur testified he visited the crime scene, believed Penny was attacked from behind, grabbed by coat and hair on left side, with one earring pulled off. Penny's neck was slashed, causing immediate unconsciousness. Police found a recently sharpened boning knife 260 yards away, which Kaur believed was the murder weapon. Susan's blue jacket had Penny's blood type, but not Susan's. The doctor that attended Susan at the scene that day was next to take the stand. He described Susan curled up on the floor of the car park near the forest. He patched up the small wound on her leg and the scratches across her stomach. Her underwear was slightly ripped and blood-stained, and when Silverton removed her gloves that she was wearing on the rather mild day, which didn't warrant the need for gloves, her hands were covered in blood. But there were no injuries when he did a follow-up on Susan a few days later. He summarized that her injuries were self-inflicted. The state pathologist then took to the stand and he described the horrific injuries to Penny and agreed with the forensic scientist that Penny would have lost consciousness straight away and would have been dead within a few minutes. As the horrific injuries were being described, Susan could be heard sobbing. A doctor was called and it was determined that Susan was not medically fit to continue the trial. When the trial resumed, Duncan took the witness stand and had to recount all the details of his affair with Susan. The defense exploited Duncan's demeanor, accusing him of being cold and indifferent towards Susan and ignoring the emotional toll the affair had on her in order to continue it to satisfy his own sexual needs. He acted callously, telling her he loved her, but in a different way than he loved his wife. As Duncan was being cross-examined by the defense, Susan sat there weeping. Next time, Susan testified for three days. She talked about her relationship with Duncan, hoping that he would leave his wife for her, though that wasn't her initial intention. She admitted that she liked being the center of attention, but denied faking illness or injury to maintain that role. She also denied lying about her pregnancy and miscarriage, and that Duncan had told her she was right to want to have an abortion. Susan grew close to Penny on Ascension Island as fellow divers. Susan admitted to being jealous of Penny, who sometimes felt the same. Penny confronted Duncan about their affair, 
but never mentioned it to Susan. I doubt this. If Penny hadn't told Duncan about her miscarriage, she didn't confront him about the affair. Penny was classy and knew Duncan would never leave her for someone like Susan. On the day of the murder, Susan claimed she felt unwell and tried canceling the meet with Penny, who had already left. They met, drove to the forest, and Susan couldn't recall the attack, claiming memory loss. She denied buying and sharpening the knife, but later admitted lying to the police, realizing she must have been the attacker. A psychiatrist assessed Susan, concluding she had depression and stress reaction at the time. Another psychiatrist found her reaction normal, with only mild depression, not a mental illness, and that she fabricated memory loss. The trial took a break for the weekend, and when it resumed the following Monday, Lord Justice Kelly provided his instructions and summary to the jury. He asked them, is it more likely than not that Susan Christie was suffering from mental abnormalities when she planned, premeditated, and executed her plan to kill Penny? That is the sole focus of this case. After four hours of deliberation and being informed that a majority verdict would be accepted, the eight men and four women of the jury reached their verdict. She was found guilty of manslaughter and cleared of the murder of Penny. Before pronouncing sentence, Lord Justice Kelly explained to the court the factors that would influence his decision. He acknowledged the gravity of the offence and the devastating impact of Penny's death on her loved ones. However, he also had to consider the personal circumstances that drove Susan to commit the crime. He pointed out that Susan was a young woman with no prior criminal history and no experience of physical relationships. The judge stressed that her affair with Duncan had triggered the events that led to Penny's death, and he was confident that Susan was unlikely to repeat such a heinous act. In the end, the judge sentenced Susan to a mere five years in prison for the heinous crime of slitting Penny's throat. It's shocking that such a lenient sentence was handed down. Upon hearing the verdict, Penny's mother was overcome with grief, crying out and shaking with emotion. In contrast, Susan showed no immediate reaction to the news. The public was outraged by the leniency of the sentence, and rightly so. Regardless of the circumstances that led Susan to kill Penny, it's clear that Penny was the true victim. The judge's consideration of Susan's age was irrelevant in this case. After all, Penny was only 24 years old when her life was brutally cut short. Where was the judge's consideration for her youth? This injustice is infuriating. The Attorney General's office referred the case to the Court of Appeal to review Susan's sentence. In 1994, a three-judge panel examined the case and ruled that Susan didn't have depression, as she was never treated for it and didn't miss work. They found she planned the killing and tried to cover it up. Her sentence was increased to nine years. Susan was released from prison in October 1995 after serving just short of five years, including time served on remand. While preparing for release, she worked outside the prison. One of her colleagues described her as a man-hungry schemer, and a businessman that had worked with her since she fully left prison described her as the most manipulative person you were ever likely to meet. I wouldn't trust her as far as I could throw her. Duncan never visited her in prison, and she was dishonorably discharged from the army. It is said that she changed her name and disappeared. Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Lauren Stewart. Lauren Stewart, a 45-year-old woman, seemed to live a life of perfection. She was a devoted wife to Dan, a caring mother to her adult children, Stephen and Bethany, and it appeared that she had been blessed by fate. However, in the weeks leading up to her unimaginable act, she ventured into a dark world, exploring disturbing content on YouTube and researching methods to end her own life, eventually becoming skilled in the use of a Glock handgun. Lauren Devine. Stewart was born on January 9th, 1973, and she spent most of her life in Michigan, her work history included part-time personal training at the YMCA in Farmington Hills and occasional house cleaning. After leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses, she had pursued modeling and acting, 
exploring her creative side through workshops and networking with photographers. She was regarded as a charming and very pleasant woman. Lauren was married to a man named Daniel Stewart, who worked at the University of Michigan as a leading software architect dedicated to developing technology for predicting heart attacks. He had many years of experience as a code developer in the technology industry. Together with his wife, they were devout Christians within the Jehovah's Witness denomination for an extended period until 2013, when they decided to explore and take a different approach to their spiritual life. The couple had two accomplished children, 27-year-old Stephen, a data solution architect, and 24-year-old Bethany, a computer whiz who showcased her talents in art and graphic design. At 45, Lauren Stewart had it all, a flourishing husband, two college-educated children, a budding modeling career, and a charming Keo Harbor home adorned with a welcoming heart wreath on the door. However, beneath this facade of perfection, she grappled with a hidden pain. Lauren had experienced the heartache of exclusion and rejection from the religion she and her husband Daniel had embraced just a few years earlier. Lauren and her husband decided to leave the Jehovah's Witness faith, a Christian denomination known for its strict indoctrination and the practice of shunning former members. The seemingly perfect exterior concealed a complex web of emotions and decisions that would soon unfold into a captivating narrative. Up until 2013, Lauren and her family had been devout Jehovah's Witnesses, strictly adhering to beliefs that eschewed celebrations like birthdays, Easter, Christmas, or any other event they believed contradicted the teachings of Christ. Additionally, their faith strongly discouraged higher education, putting Stephen and Bethany at risk of being excommunicated if they pursued college. However, Dan envisioned a brighter future for their children through higher education. When they sought approval from the church elders to allow their kids to pursue degrees, the response was firm, disobey the church's policies and face disfellowship. This threat weighed heavily on the Stuart, as almost everyone they knew, including their extended family, were part of the congregation. According to the church's rules, excommunication would mean complete isolation even from their own flesh and blood. After careful consideration, the Stuart made a bold decision to leave the religion they had long embraced. Although it initially felt right, the community's disapproval became unbearable, especially for Lauren. She described how routine tasks like grocery shopping were marred by dirty looks and hurtful comments from people she once believed were her friends. Even though the belittling remarks were not directed at her, Living in a small community of just 3,300 residents, many of whom were Jehovah's Witnesses, the Stuarts struggled with the reality that the church-approved members would constantly remind them of their outcast status whenever they had the chance. This emotional burden became too much to bear, leading to a breaking point. And in search of a lifeline, Lauren turned to the gym, making it a regular part of her life to rebuild her physical and mental well-being. Her remarkable transformation allowed her to secure a job as a fitness instructor, and she was even able to leverage her natural beauty to become a successful model, surprising those who crossed her path. During this period, Laura seemed pleasant and optimistic despite her church's rejection. However, beneath her confident facade, she was deeply and immensely suffering from chronic depression an affliction that had plagued her even before the shunning intensified with each passing day. In a desperate attempt to mask her inner turmoil, she would occasionally let glimpses of her distress show through, only to quickly conceal them with a forced smile. One of Laura's most closely guarded secrets was the family's crippling debt, which was pushing them to the brink of ruin. Confronted with this dual onslaught of financial and emotional distress, she devised a plan to resolve all her problems at once. Haunted by her inner turmoil, Lauren Stewart's downward spiral was deeply chilling and heartbreaking. She delved into grim research, scouring YouTube for methods of ending her own life and instructional videos on handling a handgun, all leading up to a fateful day on February 15th, 2018. 
She left a poignant note on the dinner table, meticulously tidied the home, and texted her loved ones, as well as her husband's boss, just before the unthinkable act. At 9.24 a.m., she turned over all the family photos on a secretary desk and sent a message to her husband's boss, stating that Dan had an accident and died. The boss reached out for further details but received no response. Hours later, at 5.7 p.m. on the same day, she reached out to her cousin, confessing that she had become evil. She stated that she had taken her husband and kids with her so they would not have to feel the impact of her selfish act and that they would sleep until Christ resurrects them. Her cousin responded, urging her not to proceed with her plan. Lauren had become increasingly detached from reality in recent months, unbeknownst to her family. She had a pistol in her possession and had tragically decided to use it against the very people she professed to love. Her first victim was her husband, 47-year-old Dan, whom she shot in the head as he attempted to flee. With her most significant threat eliminated, she went upstairs to her 24-year-old daughter Bethany's room, where Bethany was asleep, and ended her daughter's life without hesitation. Next, her son Stephen, who lived in his own place across town, unknowingly arrived at the family home, lured by false pretenses. With his back turned, unaware of the imminent danger, Lauren, the mother he loved, shot him at point-blank range. The horrifying scene didn't end there, as Lauren took the life of the family dog, placing its body in the bathtub. A neighbor had heard these shots, but assumed someone was slamming doors. The house became a chilling temporary morgue, and Lauren meticulously tidied up. The darkness culminated as Lauren turned the gun on herself, using a method she had researched online. The cousin who Lauren had texted tried texting her back, but Lauren never responded. The next morning, on February 16th, the cousin went over to her house with a friend, and when they received no response at the door, they contacted the police for a check. When the police arrived at the house that morning, the kitchen was organized, the refrigerator was stocked, and handwritten labels were on various items, with a calendar hanging on the refrigerator. Their discovery began with the family dog in the bathtub, triggering a chilling response from the officers who feared there was an active shooter. They found Stephen Stewart on the floor, believed to have been shot while seated on a chair in another room. Bethany lay lifeless, shot in her sleep with a pillow muffling the sound. Dan Stewart was discovered on the basement floor in front of a couch, his right hand still in his jeans pocket. The slightly pulled white pocket liner on his left pocket suggested he was standing when he was shot and attempted to react, thus pulling the pocket liner. Upstairs, Lauren was discovered at the base of the stairs, a pistol by her side, her self-inflicted wound between the eyes echoing her online research. Two notes were found on the dinner table. One was for the medical examiner, while the other, a chilling suicide note, exposed Lauren's inner turmoil. She wrote, I allowed evil into my heart when I chose not to accept God's free love, and it made me sick inside. I killed my family because I know my death would stumble them. At least now they will not suffer and will be resurrected to life forever in peace. As the police investigated the Stuarts' lives, a complex and puzzling picture began to emerge. Interviews with family, friends and neighbors described the couple as reclusive, with a sense of estrangement after leaving the Jehovah's Witness Church. Lauren's past was marked by her own personal challenges and some family members said she suffered from depression, which was further exacerbated by the demands of motherhood. In recent years, she became increasingly fixated on religion, often engaging in impassioned outbursts. Her family members, including her father and sister, revealed the extent of the emotional distance that had grown over time, and they had not spoken to her in years. Her mother had passed away when she was 13 years old, Estranged for years, they saw Dan as the catalyst pulling Lauren away from them and never really cared about him. They also shared troubling insights about the couple's mental health, characterizing their relationship as a fusion of mutual distress. To those who knew Lauren, 
Her defiance of the Jehovah's Witness faith marked her as an apostate, a label that spoke to her outspoken opposition to the organization and her decision to leave it. The heart-wrenching tragedy left a deep scar on the lives of those who knew the family intimately. Joyce Taylor, a longtime family friend, was visibly shaken, believing that the murders were a direct consequence of the Stuarts' rejection by the Jehovah's Witnesses. Taylor and other former members shed light on the harsh reality of leaving the faith. They explained that once you depart from the church, even your own family members who remain within its fold are forbidden from interacting with you, a severe form of shunning that takes a heavy emotional toll. According to Taylor, Lauren and Daniel's desire to provide their children with a college education clashed head-on with the religion's teachings, which frowned upon such pursuits. The collision between their aspirations and the rigid doctrines of their faith set the stage for a tragic unraveling. They were shunned everywhere and every way possible. As Taylor said, if Lauren went to the grocery store, they didn't look her in the eye. When you're raised a Jehovah's Witness, they choose your friends, they choose who you associate with. And if you go against that, they will disfellowship you or shun you. In a shocking turn of events, Joyce Taylor stormed into a Kingdom Hall meeting in Union Lake, seizing the moment to confront the congregation. Standing on a chair, she boldly criticized the gathering, her voice resonating with a mix of anger and sorrow. Excuse me, everyone, she declared. My name is Joyce Taylor. Two days ago, four people died as a result of your shunning process. Taylor's outburst sent shockwaves through the room as she pushed away congregants and vented her pent-up frustration, shouting, Five years ago, you people pulled your support from this small family. The only support they had was you people. You turned them away and you shunned them. And for what? She exclaimed, because they wanted to raise their children as they saw fit. The police were aware of the family's issues with their former church, but declined to comment. Police records detailed how Lauren had recorded a poignant two-minute video on February 6th at 11 p.m. explaining the depths of her despair. She cited a multitude of issues, expressing her inability to carry on and her desire not to burden others any longer. Abandoned by her church family, Lauren found herself drowning in a relentless sea of despair with what she believed to be the only escape, death. Convinced that ending her own life was the solution to her unbearable suffering, she made the agonizing choice to also take the lives of her loved ones, sparing them what she perceived as the inevitable shame and suffering that her actions would bring upon their household. Police records painted a grim picture of Lauren's mental state in the lead up to the tragedy, noting her unmistakable signs of severe depression and increasingly abnormal behavior. It appeared that she had immersed herself in a personal interpretation of religion, intensifying her depression. Shockingly, she never sought professional help or counseling, and no prescription drugs or alcohol were found in her system. However, traces of marijuana were discovered not just in Lauren's system, but also in her husband and sons. The police investigation unraveled a complex web of factors contributing to her devastating actions. Loneliness, the severed ties with family and friends over religious differences, and deep-seated emotional scars stemming from alleged childhood sexual abuse, all converging to amplify her anguish and ultimately driving her to commit the unthinkable. In a striking testament to the estrangement within the family, Lauren's sister's response spoke volumes. She exhibited a somber demeanor and expressed a surprising lack of surprise when hearing the news of her sister's actions, demonstrating just how far Lauren had drifted from her own sister, who even showed little regret about the tragedy. While the motives behind Lauren Stewart's horrifying actions may have been due to the profound isolation imposed by her former church and her childhood trauma, it begs the question, could things have taken a different turn had she reached out for help when she felt suffocated by her circumstances? Tragically, rather than seeking counseling or professional guidance, Lauren chose a path of self-destruction 
with devastating consequences for all involved. As we reflect on this heartbreaking tale, our thoughts are with the victims whose lives were tragically cut short and the loved ones they left behind. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you, the case of Savannah Gold. In 2017, Sherry's world was turned upside down in Florida when her daughter Savannah failed to show up for work at the restaurant where she was employed. Sherry was unaware that this ordinary day would be the last time she'd see Savannah. An hour later, the restaurant called Sherry to inform her that Savannah hadn't arrived for her shift, which was unusual since she had never missed work before. However, the events that unfolded after that call were even more bizarre. When Savannah's father received a message on her behalf, riddled with spelling mistakes and lacking punctuation, he instantly knew it wasn't his 21-year-old daughter who had written it. The impersonator claimed Savannah had met an amazing guy, fallen in love, and decided to elope with him, promising to call later. Savannah's father, Daniel Gold, carefully read the text message, paying close attention to its content. He knew his daughter well and was convinced that running away with her boyfriend was out of character for her. While Daniel studied his phone screen, trying to make sense of the message, Savannah's older brother Chris received a similar text saying she was leaving with her boyfriend and that she was okay. Daniel's instincts told him something was wrong, so he immediately started calling his daughter's phone, only to find it turned off. Savannah Page Gold was born on April 26, 1996, to Daniel and Sherry Gold. She lived with her parents and older brother Chris in Jacksonville, Florida. Savannah enjoyed various hobbies, including playing lacrosse, drawing, and dancing. Those close to her believed she embodied her last name, being a loving, kind, and caring person always willing to help others. After graduating from high school, Savannah turned down a college scholarship for art and design to care for her mother, Sherry, who had been diagnosed with cancer and was undergoing chemotherapy. To support her mother, Savannah took on household responsibilities and also worked as a waiter at Bonefish Grill, a restaurant. By the summer of 2017, she had been working at the restaurant for two years. On August 2nd, Savannah left for work at around 5 p.m wearing her uniform, as her shift was scheduled to start at 5.30 p.m. However, less than an hour later, Sherry received a call from the restaurant asking why Savannah had not shown up for work. This surprised Sherry, as she knew her daughter was responsible and had seen her leave the house in her uniform, indicating that she had indeed gone to work. After Savannah's father received a suspicious phone call, her father and brother started getting strange messages that they didn't think were from her. They suspected someone was impersonating Savannah. Before this, Savannah's father had tried to contact the police, but he couldn't reach his daughter. She was reported missing, and the police launched a search for her. Since sending those messages, Savannah's phone and social media accounts have been inactive. The police first went to the establishment where she worked, to investigate. They found her unlocked car in the parking lot, about 120 yards from the restaurant entrance. Her personal documents, wallet, cards, cash, and other valuable items were still inside the car. It was clear to the police that the story about Savannah running away with her lover was a lie. If Savannah had planned to disappear, she would have taken her documents and bank cards with her to avoid being traced. It didn't make sense that she would leave them behind in her car. Initially, there were no signs of a struggle or crime near or inside the car, except for the flat left front tire. Forensic experts were called to investigate and detectives visited the restaurant to speak with Savannah's co-workers. However, they all claimed that Savannah hadn't come to work that day and that no one had seen her. The presence of Savannah's car parked 120 yards from the restaurant, led detectives to suspect that something might have happened to her after she arrived at work. They began canvassing local establishments, particularly those with surveillance cameras, to review the footage and identify the moment Savannah parked her car. 
Although the image quality was poor, the police were able to see from the footage that Savannah parked her car, got out, and walked to a nearby silver Chevrolet Malibu sedan. For 14 minutes, she stood next to the driver's door, talking to the person behind the wheel. She then opened the back door and got in, and the driver followed suit. The police watched as the car shook and the back door swung open three times before being closed again. Officers suspected that a fight had broken out inside the car between Savannah and the Chevrolet's owner. Shortly after, the man exited the car, approached Savannah's vehicle, opened the driver's door, and removed something from inside. He then punctured the front left tire, got back into his vehicle, and drove away without Savannah ever getting out. The owner of the Chevrolet Malibu was quickly identified as Lee Rodate, a 28-year-old manager and chef at the restaurant where Savannah worked. He had helped distribute flyers with Savannah's picture during the police investigation and claimed not to have seen her for about three weeks, citing their different work shifts. However, when detectives re-interviewed restaurant employees, they discovered that Lee and Savannah's relationship went beyond a professional one. Several people came forward to reveal that the two had met secretly after hours and were romantically involved, a fact that Lee had failed to disclose to the police. On August 5th, during his work shift, Rodate was arrested and taken to the police station for questioning. When he arrived, he immediately warned the detectives that he struggled with reading and writing. In response, they thoroughly explained his rights including his right to an attorney and the fact that anything he said could be used against him in court. Rodate then admitted that he had previously lied to the police when they interviewed the restaurant staff, saying he hadn't seen Savannah in a long time. In reality, he had seen her on the day she went missing, but he was afraid that if he told the truth, he would become a suspect in her disappearance, which is why he had lied. Lee said he had met Savannah about two years ago when she started working at the restaurant. However, their socializing outside of work began around eight months ago. At that time, he was already in a relationship with someone named Chelsea. When Chelsea discovered he had been unfaithful to her, she ended their relationship. Rodate claims he dated Savannah for three months before she started using illegal drugs which led him to end their relationship and reunite with Chelsea. Following the breakup, Rodate and Savannah allegedly agreed to maintain a professional relationship limited to their work at the restaurant, as per company policy, prohibiting romantic relationships among employees. Rodate also states that Savannah had disclosed their intimate relationship to other waiters with the intention of getting him fired. Lee last saw Savannah on a Wednesday afternoon. He drove to the mall on August 2nd to talk to her and persuade her not to spread rumors about their relationship, as he feared losing his job at the restaurant where he had worked for five years. When he met her, Savannah had just taken a strong substance and was panicking, so she asked if she could sit in his car for a bit. Once inside, Lee demanded that she stop telling people they were still dating. Savannah asked him to join her in the back seat so they could talk. After moving to the back seat, Lee again asked Savannah to stop spreading rumors, but she refused, saying she would do as she pleased. This response infuriated Lee, who then got out, slashed a tire on Savannah's car, and returned. When Savannah asked why he had done it, Lee admitted he was upset and angry. Next, as Rodate claimed, Savannah exited his vehicle and headed towards the mall entrance, but didn't reach it. Instead, she got into an old green Ford pickup truck with tinted windows. At this point, she was holding her phone. However, detectives were aware that Savannah never left Rodate's car and that he was lying. Unbeknownst to Rodate, the police had surveillance footage that disproved his claim, showing no Ford pickup truck and Savannah remaining in his car. When asked about subsequent events, Lee stated that he drove home, even detailing the streets he took. Notably, the man had scratches on his arms and neck, which he attributed to a workplace injury when questioned about their origin. When detectives directly asked Rodate about Savannah's whereabouts, 
he claimed to have no knowledge. The detectives adjusted their questioning strategy. At first, they listened attentively to his stories, showing interest, but soon they applied gentle pressure. They informed him straightforwardly that evidence contradicted his claim that Savannah had exited his car. After a brief time, Rodate altered his statement, asserting that he and Savannah had gone to his residence, and then she departed. The detectives remained skeptical and urged him to reveal the entire truth, considering Savannah's family's well-being. Rodate ultimately admitted to fatally snapping Savannah's neck during a backseat argument in his vehicle. Following their departure from the parking lot, he sent messages to Savannah's father and brother from her phone before discarding it out the window. Rodate returned the body to his property, intending to dispose of it by fire, but he soon discovered it wasn't as simple as he thought. Instead, he dug a hole and buried the body, only to later exhume it, wrap it in a blanket, and drive approximately eight miles from the restaurant to a nearby pond where he discarded the body. Although the autopsy couldn't determine the exact cause of Savannah's death, the examination revealed that her neck wasn't broken, as Radate had claimed, and no illegal substances were found in her body. However, forensic experts discovered that the thyroid cartilage in Savannah's throat was fractured, suggesting strangulation, and roughly 75% of her body exhibited fire damage. Despite confessing to the crimes, Rodate maintained his not guilty plea on charges of second degree murder, tampering with evidence, and abuse of a dead body. The autopsy revealed that the condition of Savannah's body was too compromised to determine an exact cause of death. Contrary to Rodate's claims, her neck was not broken and no illegal substances were found in her system. However, the autopsy did indicate that Savannah was strangled as her thyroid cartilage was broken and approximately 75% of her body had been burned. Rodate's confession was revoked at trial where he claimed he acted in self-defense, alleging that Savannah had initiated the strangulation. This reversal put Savannah's family through additional trauma, forcing them to attend numerous court hearings. Sher Gold, Savannah's mother, has battled recurring cancer during this ordeal, but she remains committed to attending every hearing alongside her family. They have been present at 26 out of 27 hearings, enduring the emotional toll of facing Rodate, the man responsible for their daughter's death. The family's primary concern now is to bring this painful process to a close and secure justice for Savannah. Lee Rodate was not the only family member to be charged with murder. In 2016, a year before Lee committed his crime, his sister Amber Camarillo, then 26 and still known by her maiden name Rodate, shot and killed a woman during a dispute over a car. She received a 20-year prison sentence. Lee Rodate was offered a plea deal, which required him to plead guilty to second-degree murder in exchange for a 40-year prison sentence. In return, the charges of tampering with physical evidence and abuse of the body would be dropped. After consulting with his attorneys, Rodate accepted the deal and was sentenced to 40 years in prison on March 11, 2021. Following the verdict, Savannah's family expressed gratitude to everyone for their support. Daniel Gold stated that they loved Savannah and were overwhelmed to discover how many others also cared for her.